so I guess we just need to hang around for a, a few minutes for for a few people to uh, to come in. Is that cool with you guys? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. And if you want to just go through everyone, actually, we can we can just kind of introduce you guys. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and um, your your experiences in Pokemon. What ex like previous um, experience you've had competitively, and how long you've been playing? Just a brief overview. Kunal, do you want to kick us off because you are the king of the kings? So a good way to start <laughs> sure, to kick sure, us sure. off today. Yeah, so I'm Kunal. Uh, I started playing VGC at live events in 2019 start in sun series um i ended up getting my worlds invite for 2019 i played at worlds um and then i continued that here in 2020 i got top 32 at dallas um and i mean since then i've just been you know i didn't play in player scope one but i've been playing events i've been around cool thanks so much canal and Krim. I <laughs> my 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 qualifications are are nearly zilch. Uh, Lee just likes having me around for all of my <laughs> my color commentary. Um, I won the last circuit um, in the flinch squad. Uh, aside from that, I, I mostly maintain in that kind of area. I'm consistently uh, top twenty five, top fifty, top ten on both ladders showdown. Um, you know, in game. But you know that aside, I don't have a whole ton of like real world qualifications here. I just uh, I work with Lee a lot, and uh, we do some team building together. Um, when he played Botcham, he took my team last time, so uh, unfortunately didn't do as well with it as we had hoped. But you know, uh, that's it. That's me. I'm here. I'm I'm the backup resource for basically the entire crowd. <laughs> no, no backup, dude. Thanks so much. And uh, a lot of you out there will know um, Costa, so I'll let you take it away my friend because you're more than comfortable behind the mic ah you say that it's all a front Lee. that's that's <laughs> the trick um <laughs> hey guys um so basically i'm cost i was gonna say no right before right Krim, you weren't flexing at all i see um <laughs> <laughs> talking about consistently top 10 and 25 on both ladders <laughs> in game and showdown it's Love all it. i have is qualifiers <laughs> man <That's> it. <laughs> i mean it, it's solid it's so solid and for now forgot to mention that he usually builds the winning team so that's something that he should have mm, mentioned mm. too uh, sure, or at least or at events as well but anyways me i am a i started in vgc's 2016 i've been playing quite a few years um i mean i was a bit of a scrub in the beginning i might still be i think um other than that i just literally Pokemon second hand, I stream, I try to do content creation, but I fail and I cast as well whenever I have the opportunity to. So hello everybody. And well, thanks, Costa. Sorry there. I'm just <laughs> pulling messages up and getting so distracted, but that was awesome. Uh, and finally we'll end with with Addy. How are you doing, mate? And uh, thanks again for coming over to the uh, stream tonight with us all. Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Adi. Uh, I started playing back in 2017. I actually uh, got into the game watching Lee's videos on my commute to work every morning. Uh, and <laughs> nice. uh, I, I caught my first regional in 2018 in Madison Regionals. I qualified for the World Championships in 2019. And then uh, playing online, I managed to win the Rose Tower Challenge back in April and got sixth place in the North American Players' Cup uh, the first time around. Which is amazing accomplishment. So, yeah, very good, man. And uh, big congrats on that as well. So that is... Uh, cast of uh of um our panel tonight and for all of you tuning in now we are going to be discussing uh players cup from the, the 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 first players cup that we had that's recently just finished and obviously the announcement of the second players cup which is starting this friday so it's kind of a a topic tonight we want to kick off talking about players cup one the teams that we've seen do well from that event and um, the finishes certain players have had and just go over a brief kind of overview of those uh finishes and teams and it's going to help you kind of get a grounding of what to expect going into players cut two which is like i say starting this friday and playing series five rules uh unexpectedly because I, I myself thinking it would probably be series six i'm a little bit disappointed it's not um but we are ending up playing uh series series five again so i don't know if we want to kick off quickly with that and just get your thoughts uh were, were you surprised that it was series five or or you kind of expected it or I, I mean it'd be nice just to hear what you guys think about that little debacle that's obviously went on there with um the rule set um, I, I was a little surprised when they announced that it was Series 5 because I, you know, 
there was like that whole mix up where uh, Pokemon Home was saying it would be Series Six, and then the website said Series Six, and then it switched back to Series Five. Um, but overall, I think it's probably better. Uh, my personal opinion is that, like, while Series Six is very fun, I think the method that they used <clears throat> to come to that balancing decision was not the best. So I'm a little happier that Series Five ended up uh, being the competitive format. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm not happy with <laughs> either, but you know, <laughs> I feel like from Series One on, we've like progressively degraded, in my opinion. You know, like I, I, I was having fun in Series One, like Series Two, but. Like, you know, I feel like we got to series five and we kind of got locked into uh, kind of what, what's really available to us and what we can what we can use. I feel like I like a little bit of the creativity was kind of lost. Um, I actually but, I disagree a lot. And I think that a good way to, to show that is to look at the Players Cup teams. Right. There were so many different teams and like unique ideas that were presented in the first Players Cup. Um, like we saw Comfy be used and you know get placed insanely well we saw things like plus Rillaboom. we saw cinderace milotic teams right like not like hyper offense cinderace but it, you know more of a balanced take on it um we saw colossal come back in like a totally new form right and i i think that's like yeah. it really speaks to how how much series how variable series five was i guess um yeah. No, I, I I totally get what you're saying. Like I I don't disagree with you. You're gonna you're gonna probably all you guys see me and Kunal like disagree on a number of things, despite <laughs> being good friends in real life. Um, but yeah, no, I I felt it was more or less after we got going into Series Five, but there were definitely some surprises. Like by the time we hit Players Cup, I I yeah, I have to absolutely admit that. Like I you know I didn't walk into Players Cup expecting to see as much of what you just described as I saw. You know, I definitely expected to see a lot more of the standard things that I had been seeing on ladder just over and over and over again, like good stuff, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Oh, and, no, go sorry, ahead. say. No, after you, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one thing that, like, the metagame was really diverse going into the qualification stage of Players' Cup, but once we got to the second stage, I think it, partially because only 16 players were playing, but it, it really became a lot more centralized. If you look at the top eight teams, seven of, or six of the top eight, were Dragapult teams with Firewater Grass Cores. Uh, one team was a Cinderace team with a Firewater Grass Core. Uh, so I don't think they actually varied that much. Obviously, the Pokemon they used to facilitate those cores were very different, be it Urshifu or be it Colossal or be it something like Excadrill. But that being said, the metagame really centralized quite a bit, and it's made it so that there's a, a lot less diversity, I guess. No, I can agree with that for sure, yeah. And Costa, do you want to finish this one off for us? What are your opinions on it? I mean, I'll, I was gobsmacked um, because I just... <laughs> no, uh, only because I think that TPCI don't tend to have the clarity behind the decisions they're making. So you kind of like always wonder, well, I mean, is it for A reason? Is it for B? Like, give us a bit more information, please, so we can understand the thought process. But obviously... I think that when Series 6 did come along, I felt like there was still a bit more to explore from Series 5, even though it had pretty much been centralized. Um, but I was, you know, really excited with Series 6. Um, so you don't usually get to see VGC going ahead and having bans mid-season, let's say, although, you know, obviously the circuit is offline right now. But um, it's interesting seeing the 10, was it top 10 or top 15? I don't even remember. I think it was top 10. Uh -huh. Top. Uh, top 10 from both singles and doubles. Both singles, yeah. Yeah, that's it. yeah. so, I mean, it, it's interesting seeing that spin-off with it and then just seeing TPCI say, okay, listen, we had this little moment, but let's just uh, re-emphasize back onto Players Cup 2 now with Series 5. I mean, it's still fine. They're probably going to be changing it and they're going to be putting it to Series 6 in the next um, stage, I'm assuming. But then again, you never know because isn't that what they did in uh, uh, Players Cup 1? I think we started off with the series four or am I wrong? Or is it I think it, I think it was series four kicked off with, and then it changed. To <laughs> yeah. With the IC. Five. Yeah. And then it changed. Yeah. yeah. So, and then... I mean, either way, it's all right. It's still going to be a format that we've been experienced uh, with. It's not going to be a completely new one. So sure. It's going to be a bit rusty with series five for those who haven't been living on showdown right now um, for the past one to two weeks. Um, partly, 
I have been living on Showdown as well, even though <laughs> I, I should be doing other things. But um, yeah, but uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be really interesting to see if people are going to be spamming Santino's team everywhere. They're just going to be trying to copy the top, let's say, 16 that we've got, like uh, that you've got the paste of as well, the website too. Because there's some really interesting teams, like Addy was saying. There's a lot of centralized calls around uh, the Firewater Grass. And then you have Incineroars everywhere. Tony Kiss, Dragapult everywhere. Um, a couple of Sands. You, you didn't actually see as much Colossal, actually, in the top 16. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Santino having the only one there. But... Um, I, I do expect to see a bit more Colossal because people will be a bit more interested in seeing that quick method of just going ahead and just risking it all. Because having Colossal, unless you play quite defensively and smartly ahead of time, it is kind of that Pokemon that you do expect to see go down turn one if a Ron play has been made, even in Dynamax form. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Costa. And I do agree with you. I think the biggest problem with the whole rule set change errors whatever it was is the clarity the communication that we didn't get and that creates obviously a lot of us assuming and and kind of coming to our own conclusions about it when a simple message out there to say what had happened would be it would clear everything up and i think that's something to maybe take forward um uh, as an organization going forward i think it would make um it would make things a lot better in the community and it would create a lot less tensions when yeah. there's not necessarily a reason for it being there people make mistakes all the time you know um it's just about communicating them and then obviously relaying what is happening uh, because of that um so we don't know what's happening so we're left to make our own decisions but that's another uh that's another question for another day to uh, look at but um getting into the stream tonight we need to discuss what uh, players cup is i think it's a good place for us to start so players cup uh, there will be new players out there that aren't aware of what the players cup is it is a tournament run officially by the um the pokemon company international uh, they are running an online tournament obviously with the covid situation at the minute we can't have live events so this is to kind of compensate those live events and have an online system which is run around the world in the different rating zones that that pokemon has um, players are going to be able to partake in a online tournament this weekend starting on friday running through till sunday evening playing 50 battles per day and they will get a, a ranking at the end of it and the top uh, 256 players from the uk north america uh latin is it as well i think mm -hmm. and yeah, then yeah. i don't know what the numbers are for the last one but um the top ranked players from those regions will then get through to the next um qualification stages it's all played on the switch um and it is double battles as well which is the normal vgc uh, rule set which is um all you can find online and obviously we'll be showing those slides throughout uh, this this presentation and, and talk today but um how important addy i'm going to come to you first how important are the results and really understanding as you as a player going into players cup two this weekend understanding and really knowing the teams that have done well in players cup one do you think they have like a massive bearing on shaping players cup two and what players will kind of tend to see going into this tournament yeah definitely i think that if you're not familiar with a few of the top teams in the from the series five metagame and then you're going to be a step back because those teams are all very strong and you really want to know your game plans going into that i think those teams especially uh we talked a little bit about the colossal team that did so well that's a really really strong offensive team and so if you don't know your game plan going into a colossal matchup you are probably just going to get run over by that colossal and at least you could make it a little more difficult by having an idea of what you want to do how to how to counteract it uh, how you want to uh, deal with that such a uh, strong offensive threat. Similarly, we talked about the teams that revolve around Dragapult and Firewater Grass Course that are a little more balanced. And so similarly with those teams, you really have to know how to uh, power through those really, really strong defensive cores that uh, a lot of Pokemon just can't deal with. And so you need a combination of Pokemon to do that. And so just being aware of these common teams, namely Colossal, namely uh, Dragapult, Firewater Grass, and also Sun, I think is another really common team. Knowing how you're going to approach those matchups will give you a huge leg up in qualifying for the Players' Cup too. 
Yeah, that's, that's so important, I think. I think it was one of the first things I thought of when the Players Cup 2 got announced. as like, how many players are going to be running Santini's team or a very similar cause to that with the Colossal. And in your opinion, what would you what would you say is the kind of the best countermeasures in the format that we've got at the minute to uh, to to deal best with with that colossal dragapult lead that's so threatening and it's not just a dragapult colossal lead it's kind of like the urshifu or the primarina that we sometimes see paired with that as well to kind of prop that steam engine um have you got any kind of favor obviously i don't want you giving away any of your secrets if you'll be playing this weekend but i mean if you were just to give some advice to to newer players how would you what's your best approach to dealing with with those threats because it's obviously the biggest kind of number one uh thing that we're looking at right now yeah so the first step in approaching that matchup is making sure you don't get run over by the colossal and so you have to have ways to put pressure on it, usually with a water type or a ground type that can Oko it, as well as just like ways to switch around and protect and not you know, get KO'd. But the real scary part of that team is the choice band Rillaboom. And so once uh, Colossal gets its G-Max Volcalith up and is doing 1-6 chip damage to every single one of your Pokemon at the end of each turn, almost all of your Pokemon are going to be at 75-60% health. And then after your Dynamax is over, that Rillaboom can come in and clean up. So just being really aware of what Pokemon you need to keep alive in the back so that you can deal with that really powerful endgame threat allows you to uh, deal with that matchup a lot more uh, a lot more effectively. And so some of the things that I like to do is you can lead redirection in a Pokemon that KOs Colossal and then they, they can't set it up right away a lot of times. Or alternatively, I like to Dynamax Togekiss. That seems counterintuitive, but once Colossal is done with its Dynamax, its stab rock move is Meteor Beam, which is a charge up move. And so it really can't hit Colossal, uh, sorry, Colossal really can't hit Togekiss after some of this Dynamax. And of course, Rillaboom isn't great into Togekiss, Dragapult isn't great into Togekiss, Urshifu isn't great into Togekiss. They don't really have great ways to deal with it. So that's my personal favorite measure that fits on almost every team. Yeah, that's really well put, mate. I, I, I really, uh, I think that's really great information, especially for the new players and not just new players. I think just old players in general. I think it's such an important matchup to understand and have a set game plan against because, like you say, if you go into it and you're kind of not prepared for it, it will just run through you. And the the problem is with players cup the qualifying rounds is it is best of one. So you kind of want to mitigate those those problems as much as possible. So having the preparation for specific matchups like Colossal and things like that, it's going to make it a lot easier and, you, and make your run a lot better in the tournament. Because like you said, I think everyone can probably agree that we're probably going to see a bunch of Colossal teams this weekend going into the Players' Cup. So just having that matchup down is definitely a good starting point for a lot of players is that do you guys have anyone else want to chip in with that matchup or anything to do with uh, colossal in general because it is quite a big talking point after santini did win the players cup one with that core yeah so actually santino just did a very very extensive team report on his uh colossal team that went up on it's i believe 17 Nimbus or 18 page how much was I it think, I think it was nice big <laughs> Oh, it's 19. 19, sorry, yeah. my bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. And in, in that uh, report, he goes over pretty much every matchup that you can expect to face. And so he talks about how he approaches the Sun matchup, how he approaches Porygon, how he approaches Lapras. Um, and one of the teams that he said that, that he mentioned that he just has an auto loss, so he doesn't know what to do against, is uh, Comfy plus Gudra. Right? And he says, if you face this, good luck. I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> but... So, I mean, I thought that was funny, but something like I would highly recommend going and reading that team report, think, uh, looking at how he approaches his matchups and kind of using that as a basis to figure out how you plan to approach the Colossal matchup going into Player's Cup. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. Where is the, um, do, do we have the link for the um, for the team report? Is that on? Yeah, um... I, can, I can drop it in your chat real quick. Oh, that would be amazing. Thanks so much, Kunal. And that'll be really useful, I think, for a lot of the, the new guys coming up. So there we go and yeah there we go so actually uh, yeah nimbasa city post and they featured that so yeah guys make sure to check that out it is in the um the chat now so you know, like i said i think kunal makes a good point check that out because it probably covers a lot of things that you can pick up and little nuggets of information there that are going to be useful yeah going in forward to, in addition to that as well if you are interested in using the team or you're using a similar team like that's a great place to start because he has this whole pace there um and as i said he does talk about how to approach every single matchup yeah 
And I think that comes back to like a really important point. I'm kind of diverting us a little bit here, but I think it's it, the, the preparation that he put in for that tournament. And you can see the preparation is meticulous, like a 19 page document on matchups alone in the team build. I mean, it shows how much work he's put into that. So, uh, you know, that is a good example of, you know, if you're wanting to reach the kind of heights that he's reached, that's the kind of length that sometimes you have to go to um, with these teams. And if you know your team inside out, if you're super comfortable with it, that also helps because knowing your matchups is like the, the probably one of the biggest things uh, going for you and, and giving you an advantage in, in tournaments like this in general. Uh, so yeah, really good points there. Um, Costa, Krim, do you have anything you want to chip in with before we move on to our next points? I'll let Costa lead it off. Oh, that's cheeky. I was wanting you to lead it <laughs> off first. I, 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 I baton pass to you. Uh, well, I kind of rejected it. But anyways, all right, fine, I'll accept it. Um, well, I mean, with uh, Colossal, obviously, it's going to be... Well, I say obviously. It could be a very big thing that we're going to be seeing with regards to usage of the players play up to now on the coming weekend. But you have to remember that there are going to be a lot of people that are going to be trying... That they're going to be prepared for it. They're going to be having the counters to it. So it kind of... It, it's very interesting because here you're going to be seeing the clash of usage meta um where you're going to be seeing people that are going to be more prepped and then it's just all about you covering all your bases as much as possible you have to be able to recognize um what counters are good against it how you can counter those counters obviously it's down to what team you're going to be running but like everyone has been saying so far it's all about flow charting and just being aware of your matchups if you're aware of your matchups you're aware of your strengths and weaknesses you see santi's um 19 page um uh, post there or report should i say so it it just takes a lot of thought in you just uh gotta like practice and get the experience but the main thing of course is to feel comfortable with your team if you feel comfortable with your team you've played enough of matches you can recognize what kind of uh, on the spot things you need to try to go for you know like with regards to either leads or for example overall game plans for mid to end game then you're gonna be fine but obviously in the end of the day you're just gonna have fun with it because we're just talking about over obsessive things of match of uh, flow charts of matchups of this of that we could go on all day but um if you do want to do well you got to be prepped but of course remember you're gonna you just try to have some fun it's best of one anything and everything can happen best of one trust me so yeah keep that in mind you know picking up off of that that's a that's exactly kind of why i wanted you to go first because this is this is like what i wanted to touch on it is best of one so i feel like that's that's really different from when we do like the flinch squad circuit or what you normally see like in the past with pokemon best of three so um like my team that i played uh for the flinch squad circuit notoriously the games that i lost were my game one and then i would pick up game two and game three and that's how i'd get through so it's maybe not the best idea to take a team like that and then try to apply it to a best of one format like this and so i think that even when you see things it's important in best of one to be prepared for anything even some of those small different texts that you may not expect, you know, like maybe you see mixed colossal, you know, I mean, now is it going to be super common? No, but can it throw you off and cost you a game? Yeah, probably could. So, you know, there's definitely in a best of one format, you have to be prepared for a lot more. And that's where having a lot of experience or time putting in, uh, put in on playing just in general will help you be aware of, the possibilities that you might encounter. Now, it's obviously always better to lean in favor of what's more likely, but it doesn't mean that you should be making decisions that could cost you the game if it's something else that you know exists. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the the big part of this is you've got to get through the qualifier to get to that next stage where, where it will eventually be best of three. Um, and that's the, the problem a lot of the time because best of one, as we know, um, playing competitive, all of us, for quite a long time. It's not the most reliable um, means to uh, have an outcome to uh, uh, an event. But luckily, the numbers are quite um, large for qualification in each rating zone, like uh, we mentioned before. Let me just see if I can actually pull the, the rating zone and the qualification 
uh, things up here because I, I think it would be useful to kind of have it on screen and then we can we can talk about it a little bit from there so you can see yeah we've got um it is confirming that north america have 256 players then europe with 256 latin america again with 256 and then uh, oceania with 128 players so um going in we mentioned this briefly before we started the stream what were the the, the kind of the lowest bar kind of rating levels that we know that qualified and i think we were pretty sure it was around i think a safe bet was 1680 we don't know how low it went um with uh, qualifiers from the, the europe rating zone and kunal did you say it was like 1640 from the us or was it a little higher yeah so the us the lower end was like 1645 to 1650 uh europe the lower end was like 1675 ish um, yeah Oceania, uh, we had some from even, you know, like higher end 1400s qualify. Mm -hmm. um, and then America, I think the, I, I don't know for sure about Latin America, but I think the general rating was like upper 1500s uh, to like, was the, was the lower end for that. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's some, there's quite good kind of um, numbers to look at if you're wanting to qualify. And, you know, the, the beauty about the tournament in itself is you can get to that rating. You can get to like 1700. If you're in Europe, for instance, you get to 1700 and you can stop playing, then you don't need to continue anymore. And you're pretty much certain to have locked your place into the next round. And that goes the same, I think, across the board in all rating zones. If you get to 1700, uh, it looks as though from players one uh experience the qualifiers there that number is going to guarantee you into the qualification to the next round so it's always a good target to kind of aim for going into this and then not you know not risking it from that point because there's no point from previous information that we got we know that's going to be safe enough um adi is there anything that you want to cover uh, else because obviously we we haven't got you for the longest time tonight so it'd be nice to be able to uh, get a bit more of your thoughts and if you want to steer the conversation in a certain direction before you head off uh, it'd be good to hear uh, some input from yourself on this yeah i think that, that that's the first key for me is knowing your goal your rating goal uh, it, I, I'm going for 1700 as well in, in Europe. I think 1700 is safe. In North America, you're probably safe at around 1680, 1670 for sure. And so knowing that goal and stopping when you feel comfortable with your score rather than playing all 45 games, because there's no guarantee that like if you go on a losing streak in your last three games, you don't have a chance to get those points back. And you really don't want to drop out of Players' Cup qualification with a, a few unlucky losses at the very end of your run. I think the other... A uh, small like optimization that I have for doing well in tournaments like ICs is I really like to play my games later in in during that. So the tournament goes from Friday until Sunday, and so I think it's actually like Friday midnight GMT or something like that. I don't actually yeah know. Mm, yeah. But so I like to play my games later. Obviously, playing forty five games on Sunday will ruin. <laughs> but, uh, playing the games later. The reason I like that is because. Uh, you can imagine two different players who are also both at 1600 rating one who is eight and oh just started out and is probably going to finish at 1700 or higher than that the other player is like 23 and 15 and is almost done with their run and has sort of plateaued you'd you'd imagine that the player who's 23 and 15 is a little worse but you're much more likely to face that player at which towards the end of uh this on like sunday or on saturday rather than at the very beginning when the players who are at 1600 have won almost all of their games, but you're getting the same number of points for playing both of them. And so that's why I like to play a lot of my games towards the end of the qualification period. So that I know that I'm getting as many points as possible and I'm generally facing a little easier players at every possible rating. When yeah, you a... say at the end, sorry Lee, when you say yeah. at the end, do you mean Sunday 45 or do you mean Saturday, Sunday? Because you're gonna drive me crazy now. <laughs> so what my, my personal preference, what I like to do is uh, I don't play at all on the first day, and then I start playing on the second day, right as everyone is allowed to play their next set of 15 games, because mm -hmm. that's when uh, the players who are like 15, 70, if you get matched up with one of them and they played 15 games, that's like not as difficult as someone who is again like five and zero. Oh. But that's right as those players who have just started playing the second set of 15 games. So you really, I think, maximizing the uh, like you want to pe play people who have played many more games than you, right? Yeah. Those are the people who have sort of plateaued. And so ideally you start playing for me at least I, I start playing 
right as the uh, second day or the third day starts. And then make sure that I'm at a comfortable level so I don't have to rush all of the games in the last minute on Sunday. Yeah, that's that's a smart that's a smart strategy. That's going like a step further, isn't it? It's not just the tournament starting you jumping on at the first hurdle and thinking, right, let's get to get to this mark as soon as possible, and then having maybe a bit of a rough time. Where you're kind of thinking about it, stepping back a little bit and actually looking at the actual tournament as a, a bit more strategical than than normally just diving in head first. And I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Like you say, you're going to pick up maybe those less stronger players at the end of the tournament, which is going to make it easier for you to get that point goal. And at the end of the day, it's not about winning this tournament. It's not about getting the highest ranking. You've got to look at it as just getting to a bar and getting over that bar. And as soon as you do that, just you can finish. You know, it's not you're not getting any glory for getting any higher. There's no kind of medals going out for for getting number one. No one really cares about that to be honest it's just getting through to the next stage and it's kind of a means to an end so doing it in that kind of um, manner i think is very very smart i think Addy. that's a it's a really good bit of information for players we've got a, um, a little question here from cameron block block you too if you know you can't play double a limb stage should you even bother with the qualification well what, what, what <laughs> it's a bit of an open-ended question i think i think if you can play this weekend i think you should play um whether or not you can play double lm or not i think it's always a nice opportunity to get some practice in and you you're likely going to face a lot of tough top players so it's, it's always good to try and play um it's just a question of whether or not you'll be taking a spot up from someone that could play obviously that's the moral of the uh the question there so that's um something to think about as well because there are only a certain limited number of spots but if you qualify you get through and you can't play then you know you've you've earned that so no one really can take that away from you so it's it's a bit of a there we go cameron that's my two cents on it i'll leave it up to you mate <laughs> well i mean the issue with uh that is like you said lee it's literally down to if you're blocking someone by beating them and they're trying to go for it and they haven't accounted all that but also if you're not going for it or i'm not sure if he means by purely uh playing the double elimination stage like because they're unavailable or do they mean by accounts like whether they signed up because there's gonna be a lot of people that still won't have their accounts signed up and mm. they're still gonna play and they're not even gonna be counted in as well and they're just gonna be like going off to twitter next but anyways but, yeah, yeah. That's so. a good point, Costa. Actually, before we go any further, if you haven't signed up yet and you are looking to sign up, make sure you link your, your Nintendo account to your Play Pokemon account. You can do that through the Play Pokemon page. There'll be a guide with how you can do that in-game um, and on online. It's all online where you do it, and the, the accounts will link up. And then after that's all done, sign up. Otherwise, you won't get through to the qualification stages, even if you hit that, that higher rating, which is a little bit unfortunate. I think they've been a bit clearer about at this time in the signups the making sure that players know then and, and be aware of this uh, before signing up because i mean it must be devastating if you signed up in players cup one didn't realize this got the rating and then the qualifying rounds came out and your name wasn't on there because you didn't link your account i mean i'd be devastated i do you know a couple of players that that happened to so you just make sure if you are signing up obviously sign ups close tomorrow evening um so make sure you do do that beforehand if you are planning on playing this weekend so adi anything else you would like to mention obviously we've just uh, i'm sorry i'm kind of jumping on you every time here but i know time is ticking away and you're gonna have to jump off in a minute but if there's anything you'd like to kind of um finish on before we um we have to say Bye bye. That would be uh, that'd be great. Yeah, I do have to run, but uh, first off, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, it's been a blast, and I've really enjoyed doing this. I also just want to quickly plug my own YouTube channel, uh, CK49, where I do a lot of in depth breakdowns of top teams, as well as interviewing uh, a lot of top players who have recently done well in tournaments. So if you like the sort of breakdown that I gave in like the first twenty minutes, uh, please make sure to check that out. I'd really appreciate it. 
definitely check out the youtube channel i was only made aware of it it's such a it, dude we need to get the word out because yeah the content on it is amazing you guys out there will really enjoy it it's really useful really informative stuff so make sure you do check out all the the social stuff Addy is on the, the the screen right now so make sure you drop him a, a follow on twitter and uh, obviously go and sub to his youtube channel because it is full of good stuff so Addy, thank you so much man for coming on uh it's sad to lose you so early on in this but hopefully we can do another one of these and uh, maybe after qualifiers maybe we look at uh, the, the the next stage of this it'd be really cool to have you on again and get the gang back together and uh, do this again so yeah thank you so much for coming on it's been a pleasure yeah thanks i'm looking forward to it cool man all right dude well we'll we'll catch you up thanks oh, Eddie. No, he's oh, gone oh well four of us he's gone um <laughs> No, but he makes some re re really great points. Yeah, and I've, I've gotten to look at some of his content. Like, it's it's pretty comprehensive from what I've gotten to look at. So, I, yeah, I would also recommend to go over there and check it out. Yeah, so, like, even though uh, a lot of the teams that uh, he interviewed players for on his channel, I was even, like, you know, I was a part of the building process, or I saw the building process happen. And even despite that, I was still learning stuff about that building process and about how the team works by watching those videos. So he really does a great job of going in depth with those players. Uh, he has a lot of big names on the channel. You know, he has uh, Nails, Nick Navar, he has uh, yeah. John Evans, he has Ragov. These are all like you know, insanely good players that play at the highest world's level. So uh, I, I think that's a great resource. You should definitely go and check it out. And I'm sure that he'll have interviews coming in after Players Cup Two as well. Yeah, undoubtedly. I think it's just going to kind of ramp up a little bit, and the content keep coming. Um, yeah, so definitely check that out, guys. I'm just going to throw his socials up again on the screen just so you can check them out. That's um, obviously his Twitter at, um, there we go, down below. Yeah, you can check it all out. And his YouTube at CK49. So, yeah, there we go. That was Addy, but really great to have him on, like you say. And um, we're going to be moving on to the next stage of this chat. We've obviously talked about how you can enter um, ways in which you can approach the tournament being a best of one qualifier. Uh, we touched a, literally on, on Santini's team, which was the winning team from the tournament. So um, where do you want to go from here? Do you want to have a look at the, the, the top eight and what other kind of archetypes? Because Colossal isn't the only team we need to prepare for this weekend. Obviously, there are a lot of other teams that performed extremely well over the weekend. Um, sorry, not over the weekend, but obviously over the um, over the tournament, the span life of the tournament itself. Um, so there's lots of combinations here that you, you need to also be aware of and have game plans for. But um, does anyone have anything that they would like to kind of kick us off within this next segment of the uh, the evening? Yeah, so if you look at the Players' Cup Finals teams that are on screen right now, I think the first thing that a lot of people are going to see is that row of Incineroars from top to bottom, first all the way down, right? Yeah. Incineroars, the Dragapult 2, the Togekiss. You're going to see a lot of Rillabooms, a lot of Porygon 2s, a lot of Primarinas. So these are all Pokemon that are very, very good mid-ground Pokemon. And yeah. what I mean when I say mid-ground is they're Pokemon that don't rely on speed control too heavily, they don't rely on supporting Pokemon. They don't need to set up to do damage. They're Pokemon that you send out onto the field and you have pressure with them in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. Instant has Fake Out. It can click Parting Shot. It can click Snarl sometimes. It can click Flare Blitz to do damage. It can also click Burning Jealousy, which is a move that not a lot of people thought about before Players Cup 1. And uh, Burning Jealousy you know, is a great counter to, to Pokemon like Cinderace or, or Bisharp or Dragapult. Because yep. if they Dynamax... Anything them, with Dynamax and boosts, boosts, yeah. Yeah, you just yeah. burn them, right? Togekiss obviously is great. It's been great since the start of this format. You know, it can Dynamax. It has a 50% chance to crit if it holds a scope lens. Um, it's, you know, it's redirection as follow me. It has great coverage. It can run Yawn. It can run Babiri Berry. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just so much set coverage with it. Uh, yeah. Dragapult as well. It supports all of these Pokemon very, very well with its max moves. Uh, Phantasm dropping both opponents' defense for Pokemon like Excadrill or Incin. Um, Airstream boosting speed for Urshifu potentially, right? Dragapult mm -hmm. can click Surf to proc Colossal Weakness Policy. So mm -hmm. these are all Pokemon that are like, you have to know what common sets they have, what teams they're on, uh, and what to expect when you see them on the field. Yeah. yeah. 
no Certainly. completely i think like we just had a a, a comment up there from uh, that's a plus one phil he's he's saying that no Vena, venusaur in top cut from last time that's it's surprising and i i completely agree with them i'm surprised that there is no sun in there at all you know that's one of the archetypes that i would have thought would have done extremely well going into um season season well the, the first players cup you know um considering how dominant it was on the rated battle ladder in series five but to kind of not see any of it in top eight is it just an indication that players are over prepared for it knowing that it's going to be one of those calls that um a lot of players kind of are going to be using so the over preparation for that means that it hasn't done quite so well or is it just probably not kind of hit its peak yet in kind of an online official tournament yet and are we likely to see a lot of that coming into this 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 weekend coming up so i feel like i can probably speak on this a little bit considering i the team that I used in the flinch squad circuit was, uh, was partly sun. Okay. Um, it was Venu Torkel, but it, I mean, it wasn't what I would consider, you know, like full on sun based team. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the biggest problems with it was, like you said, there was a number of people who were like, as you could say, over prepared for it. But I do think that that's dropped off a little bit since then. Like I'm not seeing, like before I had to basically plan on every toga kiss or every incineroar probably having like safety goggles, every bravery being lumberry, like, you know, so it, it just had a lot of ways to kind of prevent that. So I think it was a combination of that. And the fact that there's smarter ways to maybe be playing Venusaur than the typical way that people just assume, like, I'm just going to sleep powder spam. And then, you know, that's how I want to use my Venusaur. So, you know, that's that's what a lot of like maybe the more inexperienced players probably took to when they just jumped off with it right away. So that I think that kind of contributed to what we've seen from the first Players' Cup. And I think that maybe it changes a little bit with the second Players' Cup because there are some aspects um, that, that Venu can take care of. Like, for example, um, if you can get Venusaur and Sun and then you can get Urshifu next to it, lots of times that's a great way to try and handle PZ, um, stuff like that. It's one of the few things like with Life Orb that can deal with a Clefairy um, or what you commonly see for redirection, which is a lot of fairy. Um, so I, I think that you'll see more of it. Is it the best thing in the world? I don't know. I mean, there's there's still a lot of RNG that has to go into it as well. You know, if you're going to run Life Orb Venu, which is probably more stable for some of your gameplays and not have to rely on Sleep Powder too much, then that's good. But I mean, Lee can pull up my pace and you can see that on my team, I had wide lens. Yeah, because sure. I, I had to I had to depend on that more. But that the I think the final point I want to touch on with Sun, especially with Venusaur, is the fact that like going back to what I was saying earlier, when I played with it, I lost a lot of my first games and then I won my games two and three. And I think Venusaur was a little bit stronger for me in a best of three format than it was in a best of one, because after I could identify those items and figure out what people were using, it was a lot easier for me to like reformulate my game plan, come back and attack it in a completely different way. Yeah, and Does anyone so, else want to hop on that? Oh, Kunal, I think, sorry. Uh, I think another reason that we didn't see a lot of Sun in Players' Cup Top Cut is that... Um, so Sun, Venusaur especially, is like an amazing Pokemon. Sun is probably one of the best archetypes in Series 5. But a lot of what Sun does is um, kind of shut down. Not, maybe not shut down, but it's not pop against Dragapult Incineroar. Yeah. Right? Incineroar... Uh, one of its most common items was safety goggles. Mm. And Incineroar, you know, when, when Sun is up, Venusaur can hit Incineroar with Max Quake, I guess. Mm -hmm. But Incineroar is hitting it back with a Flare Blitz that's doing 90% of its health, right? Yeah. Venusaur doesn't have great ways to hit Dragapult, and Dragapult can click Max Airstream into it. And yep. so, uh, on top of that also, uh, Pokemon like T-Char turning off the Sun for their Excadrill is, like, generally going to be pretty positive against Venusaur. And so a lot of what Sun does is reliant on maintaining a perfect core <clears throat> position and maintaining perfect speed control that's favorable for you. And that's yeah. very hard to do uh, consistently and reliably, I think. Yeah. And so yeah. a, lot of the, a lot of the people in Players' Cup kind of opted for this, like Togekiss, Dragapult, X-Girl team, because 
it's a lot easier to maintain a reliable position and it's a lot easier to pivot out of unfavorable leads. Uh, and yeah. that's uh, that's kind of the the main reason I think that we didn't see a lot of sun. And Lee's um, got that up right now with the safety goggles. I think before in Players <clears throat> Cup one, the percentage usage on that was like forty percent. Mm, so you yeah. can see that it it has dropped because I mean it is you you are using it for some different things, but that doesn't mean that you're safe by any means to just like freely click a sleep powder into Incineroar, especially in a best of one like format where you're going to be put putting you're going to be gambling a lot on that like right off the bat. Yeah, and I think and I think that's evident from the top cut as well itself. You see, there's a plethora of Dragapult and Incineroar everywhere and um there's also ferrothorns as well which i know that tortoise can deal with but if you put it in the right position you get rid of the tortoise venu can't do much against a ferrothorn it's just gonna like 1v1 it eventually at some point um but uh i'm not sure i think i think the venusaur is so strong it is so strong especially with the life orb and all that and then you've seen like in the euro cup for example we saw a lot of venusaurs and that was uh series five so uh, we saw venusaurs and dustlops being paired up uh next to each other you threaten the trick room so you can have total in the back or you just go and ally switch or even helping hand get rid of the main threat and try to bluff it out so uh, it is a bit surprising but when you look at the top cut and you can start picking up to why there isn't as much venusaurs because you just you can see some pretty good counters to it not counters but it just these are players that have played their games out like they've played mm -hmm. the top level to reach the top cut of players cup so having even the slightest uh, tools in their availability, they're going to be able to take advantage and try to do the best they can. And they were able to go and kick out Venusaur completely and allow a Drapion in somehow. <laughs> I don't know how they did that, but, you know, I mean, fair play to Giovanni Polanco right there. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> yeah. We had an interesting question, actually, just to kind of segue for a moment from uh, Computer Kids. Um, he asks, do you think series uh, season six teams would perform well in Players Cup 2 or only teams from series five? So who wants to head up this one? Um, I think that 90% of teams that are good in series six would not be good in series five. Mm. Um, I'm gonna agree with that. I think the I, I would say that the one exception is some variation on like a beat up Terrakion team. Um, there yeah. was a there was a Terrakion team that I faced in the Rose Tower LCQ, and it was like Dragapult, Terrakion, uh, Gyarados, Arcanine, P2, Amoongus, or something something similar to that. Um, and that team that team actually didn't have beat up on the Dragapult. They just used Terrakion as an offensive lead, and they mm -hmm. could max the Dragapult or they could max the Terrakion. And I think mm -hmm. that kind of team is like the closest to a Series Six team that would do well. Um, yeah. Yeah. But other like other than that, I think a lot of what's good in Series Six is kind of countered by Tyranitar existing or Cinderace or Rillaboom. Togekiss. Uh, yeah, Togekiss oh. especially. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. One, so there's one exception actually. Uh, a player named Roxon did very very well in Players Cup Series Five. He used a team of Drake's old Corviknight, Arcanine, uh, yeah, Gastron. Yeah. 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 And his team yeah. his team actually did not have a single Pokemon banned from moving from Series Five to Series Six. Oh wow. And That's so his, so. I think that his team, like Drake's old stuff, is probably going to be very good in Series Five still. Yeah. Uh, in spite of, you know, the end Pokemon coming back. I've seen a lot of really like um, inspired uh, Drake's old like plays and stuff too. Like um, I know that uh, Luigi, who we've seen before in Rose Tower and et cetera, et cetera, was uh, having some fun with uh, wheezing and choice scarf yeah. Drake is alt and uh, <laughs> being able to pull away the, uh, the hustle accuracy at the same time. I, I mean, it, now do I think that that's something you're going to see a ton of here? No, but um, it, it's, there's definitely some interesting ways to play it that I think are still yet unexplored. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if you encounter something like that. Yeah, no, that's true. And there's uh, Canals throwing up the poker pace there from uh, Raga's team uh, from the Players Cup. Um, I don't know. Let me just see if I can grab that because I can't, can't seem to grab it from the uh, from the chat. All I can seem to do is get um, 
is just get the hide or unhide button, which is not ideal for me right now. But um, can I, could you drop that in the private chat, uh, just in the background, and I can pull that up for the guys to see on screen here as well. It might be worth looking at. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much, mate. But yeah, good. it's it's a good point. I think you know, I I, I personally wouldn't feel super comfortable about using um, a series six team in, in in this tournament especially the qualifying round i think the pokemon like that, that have been banned been banned for a reason you know uh they are the, the you know we're not beating about the bush they're the strongest uh pokemon that we've got available to us um so you're kind of putting yourself maybe not on a disadvantage almost but you know th there is the little bit of a disadvantage that you're going to put yourself with at by not taking advantage of these Pokemon that are available to us again. Um, but yeah, there we go. We can see the team on the screen now, which is uh, the Corviknight, the Drake Result, uh, Grimmsnarl, Gastrodon, Arcanine, and Rillaboom. It's a nicely balanced team, isn't it? And you can see something like this because of the, the synergy that you've got in there um, alone uh, between the Typhons and, and the techs that are there. I mean, you can see why it's done well. And something like this, if you're well versed with it and you know the team inside out, I could see you doing quite well with it, you know, and, and the actual tournament itself. So um that's make a, good a lot of topic sense to touch on too. Like yeah. I think being anything that you're familiar with is probably going to be a, a little bit better for you to 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 roll with going into this instead of trying to jump onto something last minute, especially for those of us that haven't been playing for a, a longer time, you know um i I've, I've found in my experience that usually jumping in with something that i'm not as familiar with is is a little more disastrous than if i jumping into um games with something that i've played a lot so i'm much more familiar with the scenarios and what i need to do and what my game plans are yeah and that's something that i wanted to touch on as well is um especially for this format of tournament right it's just an online ic they're best of one games you're playing a set number of games every weekend or every day for the weekend and so um you're gonna get a lot more value on average out of a team that you're very comfortable with and you understand the board states of than you are from trying to find the perfect team and you know put it together for this tournament yeah because look we agreed <laughs> <laughs> a team a team that you're comfortable with right you're gonna know exactly what you're idea is like what, what your goal is in every board state right when you see two pokemon in front of you this is how i want to position my board and my team in front of these two pokemon right and it's yeah. it's a lot of like familiarity with the team and understanding damage roles and understanding uh what pokemon you can switch and when mm -hmm. it, it's like it that's gonna get you a lot further in a best of one tournament than trying to find the perfect ideal series five team is yeah, oh, there, there I, is no perfect team. Yeah, uh, it's just that there is no perfect team. There's yeah. always going to be some Unless holes Grinnell on the boat. And, and Unless Grinnell be in there. Uh, uh, facts. <laughs> facts, facts, facts. No, yeah. but um, exactly that. It's just being like Grinnell's saying, like everyone's saying, it's just being able to, on average, handle any average team across from you. So, just in the end of the day, matchups, of course, knowing how to go into the game. Because obviously a big point is matchups, but the the main issue with matchups, right? When you're like, oh, I've got a bad matchup against this uh, opponent or something like that, mm -hmm. is okay. Sure, you can have a bad matchup, but do you have a counter to it? Do you recognize that this is a bad matchup, and do you have a way out of it? Because then it, go it feeds back into team building. So team building is so essential, and you have to absolutely try to fill in as many holes as possible. But there's, yeah. there's always going to be something that um you're going to be weak to so it's just being able to recognize that and that maybe that's where perhaps rng comes into play maybe some other inadvert tactic that you have to try to go for because of the situation but mm. um yeah there's uh, a lot okay. of good questions here mm. that's oh, some yeah, really that's good it. advice though guys i think that like what you're coming back to being more comfortable with a team than rather than looking for that team that's going to maybe be something that's like meta breaking or you're hunting for that meta breaking team or something like that it's always a better idea to fall back on a team that you know inside out and that is the most valuable information i think that you're going to get from all of us tonight i think especially going into a qualifier 
it, you know, like we mentioned earlier on, it doesn't matter about winning this event. It's not about winning. It's about just hitting a, a rating number, and then you can you can then concentrate on that that perfect team that you you've got on your mind for the next stage of the tournament. And that's what you need to to really think about. Get through this first step with something that you know that you're familiar with, and then go from there. But um, for newer players that maybe haven't played that much Series Five, that they're, they're kind of the ones that I want to uh, just hit on a little bit here. And Nappy actually asks a really good question uh, because of all the, the issues that there, there are around it being Series Five and not Series Six. It does leave us a little bit um, at a deficit for places to practice at the minute. And um, so he asks, is there any tools that we can uh, recommend using in order to prepare for for this tournament coming up? Which is a great question. Um, I mean, the showdown that would be my my initial um, and probably my only place that you could really uh, go to, unless you've got friend groups yeah and um there are actually have been quite a lot of tournaments set up um on twitter by a number of people and yeah. um, practice tournaments and things like that but outside of that i don't know if you guys know of anything else um where people can go to practice or yes mount silver actually runs two events every week uh and they have been running series five tournaments recently and they're just best of three tournaments you know you show up i think they run on, on tuesdays and thursdays Mm -hmm. And so uh, those are you've got one more chance. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pretty much. And then in addition to that, like we mentioned, there's a lot of people that are setting up. Uh, I think they're referred to as friendly tournaments on on Twitter, where you just go on Battle Spot, you go to online competitions, and you can sign up through there, uh, through a code mm -hmm. post on Twitter. And mm -hmm. the way yeah. that works is like you have like two hours or whatever to ladder, and it's just like essentially a ladder, where you're just laddering against other people in the tournament, and whoever you know has the highest rating at the end is first place. So mm -hmm. essentially what Ronaldo's is saying, it's the perfect um, practice mm -hmm. that you can ever think of and try to get into a scenario. Because yeah. um, it literally is emulating best of one series five in the form of a ladder. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's um, Super Josh coming up here, uh, currently watching <laughs> and... Uh, but uh wonder what this chat is about so for josh and anyone else that has just jumped in recently and thinking what the heck is going on what are these guys talking about we are talking about players cup at the minute there was um obviously the uh, players cup one which finished not so long ago we saw santini win that um event and they have announced a players cup two which will be starting this um friday uh, Sign-ups are still open. You can sign up on your Switch. Just make sure you link your Nintendo account before you do sign up. Otherwise, you won't be able to qualify. Um, but this is the tournament that we're talking about, Josh, and to anyone else. Um, we're talking about preparation, what teams to expect coming into this event, and um, how to the best prepare really and what things to think about going into the event in general i think it was quite a uh it was an interesting topic of mine and i i picked uh and asked certain people to come on and i i feel like we're very privileged to have uh these players here with us tonight with their insights and knowledge that they can provide and help uh, especially some of the new players in the, the the format and not just the new players i think even the more experienced ones there's a lot to learn and it's always nice to hear other people's opinions on on uh, these sort of things and um help you get into a good place and a, a, a mindset i guess going into the tournament to get you uh hopefully qualified for that next stage really so yeah that's what it's all about um we're just talking about um well series six teams going into series five which wouldn't work um but yeah i think other archetypes as well are worth mentioning in um going into this because we've obviously covered the dragapult the incineroar stuff uh the sun matchup colossal is there anything else that any of you would like to touch on that you think might be quite popular? I think one thing I would mention is I think from the, the list of top cut teams that we saw, one that really jumped out at me that I did really like, and it was one that I think we might see a little bit more of, maybe not in, in this early stage of the qualifying rounds of the tournament, but maybe in the next stages is a team by, I think it was Alistair. Um, I think he's an Australian, yeah. Alistair yeah. Sandova, um, and this team really caught my eye. I think he he, ha he was featured on um, Amity Graham's YouTube channel playing the team. Really interesting concept because it, it kind of just looks like a generic P2 team, but he had a really interesting Incineroar set on there with um, Flare Blitz and Earthquake. Um, and did he have Claus 
combat i don't know if he had close combat but it was a really interesting it wasn't your generic kind of incineral yeah, set defensive yeah yeah but it did it did do the supporting job as well and i think it'd be good to maybe touch on a few other calls that you guys can see being popular what to expect kind of going into it if there are any that we haven't mentioned already and maybe some certain sets on pokemon uh, that you could see maybe doing well and uh, i know johnny mentioned a, a a little while ago he did say any wild picks you feel would be good in the ic but i think that's probably a question that we'll come back to right at the end so do remind us johnny i think it'd be more fitting to end the stream on something like a hot pick from from all of us before we head off I'm well, trying to think of fire types now. I think so, Kunal had, had a really good list of um, common core stuff that you can expect to see. He can probably rattle it off faster than any of us. Yeah, so yes. I think some of the cores we haven't talked about are uh, like general Cinderace offense. Um, so Yuri won the Invitational uh, before the Players' Cup with Cinderace Bisharp. And yeah. uh, Cinderace yeah. in general is a very good mod at generating offense, right? It's yeah. It has Libero, so it's changing its type. It always has Stab on all of its moves. And then it just gets a huge assortment of moves, right? <laughs> it gets uh, bounce, so you can run max airstream. It gets max steel spike. It gets max fighting, and um, so and you can never of, guarantee what's on it either. Yeah, well, I mean, for for players' cup, you can, right? Because you have team sheets. But well, sure. yeah, okay, yeah. But then we saw Yuri also have Giga Impact. That yeah, Giga didn't Impact usually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's especially Giga useful Impact for taking out like Rotoms in one shot. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and then there was also like offensive Lapras started to pop up where the Lapras was just fast and you you paired it with like Windscott or Talonflame mm -hmm. uh, and it, the Lapras just had Life Orb, right? And yep. and that's something that, you know, prior to Series 5, we had only ever seen Light Clay Lapras. Uh, and mm -hmm. the goal is, you know, set up screens and have them for eight turns and then set up Trick Room and win with Kong. Was kind of yeah. like the idea before that. Yeah, no, I think offensive Lapras is definitely something to to still watch out for. Like, I, I played a whole bunch of that. That was kind of like my backup team to my uh, my my Torque Venu one. Um, and I think that its its strongest suit is being able to pack something in the back like um, AV Conk or like Dracovish or whatever that can actually already kind of take a hit and then throw up a screen in front of it and just give it like that one extra turn that it might need to live whatever it's got to live just to really be able to start destroying something or doing some real damage. Not to mention the Life Orb Lapras itself doing a ton of damage. I mean, like if you watched it, like the way I used it was with like Thunder, Blizzard, Freeze, Dry, Hydro Pump, like no protect whatsoever. Yeah. And I mean, when you launched off like a Life Orb Max Blizzard, and just watched how much damage it laid into a Ferrothorn. It was impressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And then uh, the last one sure. that I think is really, really important to know is the Porygon Z matchup. And you know, Absolutely. Porygon Z is a Pokemon that everybody hates. Everybody <laughs> loves to to say that Porygon Z is unhealthy and it's unbalanced. <laughs> and, um, Not me. <laughs> so, i mean more so I, than sleep powder venusaur like <laughs> no 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 okay no i take that back venusaur is the worst for me but um pz is right up there pz is right yeah. up there yeah pz if you can't beat him to... join him guys i don't need to say anything <laughs> on pz pz is very like or shifu in the back you know it's mm. it's brutal it's brutal i'm just yeah. in a portion of the good. show where we get to complain about ally switch or ah <laughs> well. Geraladon. Barristuda. There there's, a, there's a hot pick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. I see. Okay. I'm not sure if um uh if uh Phil's still in chat, that's a plus one, but I saw him release a video on uh Barristuda and um Alakazam, which was very, very interesting. Um basically a lot of fun early format, but I mean now that we've got yeah. Incineroar, it kind of like shuts down the uh the Barascuda idea for the most part. I, I mean, any intimidate kind of kind of just slows it to the point, just to the point of where you can kind of stop it up. I, I do think that Braviary deserves a mention as far as something that I expect to see at least a little bit of because I've seen it more recently on ladder and being rather successful and being able to stop up a lot of cores or gum up some things. Um, having Lumberry on it, it's super useful against things like the Venusaur stuff, um, against Burning Jealousy. Um, against Yawn, which are common texts that we're seeing more and more of, like we're seeing more burning jelly, burn, burning jealousy in Cineroar, aside from just Torkoal having it. We're seeing more Yawn Togekiss than we were before. In fact, I think if you take a look, like even in the higher rankings, 
Toga Kiss, like if they don't have protect, they probably have yawn. Like it's it's I think it's its fifth most popular move. In fact, I can I can confirm that right now. It is. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I would say that uh is it the best choice? No, but I wouldn't put it out of out of your team building plans because I've seen some great teams just totally drop down to a good Braviary team. Yeah, so I think Braviary is actually really interesting. It was something that I had wanted to mention this uh, during this chat because if you look at the Players' Cup top cut teams, right, almost every team has an Incineroar, almost every okay. team has a Dragapult. And Braviary is a Pokemon that is mm. very, very good against both of those Pokemon. Right, Dragapult yeah, yeah. Boom. Max Phantasm. Dragapult can't click Max Warwind versus it because it's going to get, it's going to proc Defiant. Um, and Sonora Intimidate procs the Defiant and then dies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's good versus Rillaboom. Uh, it's pretty good versus Amoongus. It's pretty good versus, like, uh, it, it, I, I would say it's solid versus Togekiss. It's not the best. It's good versus Urshifu. Mm -hmm. And so the, the other big thing about Braviary is that it actually takes advantage of Cinderace and Bolt in a very similar way to how Bisharp does. Yeah. And so teams like with pa pairing Braviary with Cinderace or with Dragapult is actually something that I think is very interesting moving forward and something that I haven't seen a lot of uh, in Series 5 yet. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think um, it'd be interesting now, I think, probably a good time to have a look at the because Japan had their, mm -hmm. their kind of their own tournament, didn't they, uh, outside of the Players' Cup. Um, it'd be good to have a look. I'm surprised there's no bravery on these teams as well, Kunal, because I think you make an extremely good point when you just like making observations about the, the trends of Pokemon that are in that top eight, you would think where are the bravery there? Cause if the, if there was a team with that on and you've got decent answers to things like Colossal within that team, you think it, it, it's going to take a lot to kind of beat that Pokemon um, and a lot of hard work to kind of get around it because of the, the coverage that it's got move wise and um, yeah, the yeah you're seeing a lot of rock slide Braviary now too, which is mm, yeah. something you didn't see like when we had Players Cup one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, as well as Scarf, I've been seeing as well. Scarf, mm -hmm. so they could try to get the wind up as well. Edu was running that for a while. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah. You could just Dynamax it as well, kind of treat it as if it is your Dynamax, and then, you know, pop the surprise of it being a Scarf at the end of it, where you can then choose which move to lock into. Yeah. Just, yeah. There's a good luck trying to find during... There was a period during Series 3, I think, or mm. Series 2 <laughs> even, before Series 3. I think it was Series I, 2, Kunal, because I can yeah. remember you talking to me about this. Yeah. And uh, I, I just the device that Scarf on Sand was like one of the best sets because you get the Scarf Tailwind, and Bravery mm. just complements Sand so well, both as a Dynamax Pokemon and as like, you know, Scarf U-Turn to bring in your T-Tar for your extra drill. Like just mm. uh, interactions like that were very cool. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I'm a big fan of Bravery. I, I also do expect to see it in this player's cup for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you think a good partner to it could be Indeedy? Kind of chance. Um, I, I can see it. I mean, maybe Doddles as well, just in case on Venusaur matchups. I feel like it's just going to absolutely obliterate some team, or at least the Venusaur matchup if it's paired uh -huh. next. Time. We've seen a lot of interesting stuff with it. I've also seen it used to good effect with like uh, Rhyperior as well, and where they just like banded it and then. Oh, just no, like, don't. I, <laughs> I don't know if you yeah if you remember it's horrible you remember remembering that. yeah yeah no uh that's uh that's that's a pretty interesting tech i i mean there's other things that it can do that with right like i mean in the same aspect that cinderace can boost up speed and boost up your attack so can braviary so um i i would say that there's a number of pokemon that we have available us to us out there that can really benefit from that i mean they could just as easily be a tyranitar or something yeah that's a good point completely um i did just pull up just a minute ago um as i was mentioning i i was kind of cutting you guys off in mid flow so i will um i'll i'll kind of bring it up now but um obviously with the majority of the world having the players cup like i mentioned um japan had their own kind of standalone uh which was the decisive battle tournament um so there's 150 qualified players. I'm pretty sure their qualification ran similar to ours, if not at the same time as ours. Um, I'm not really too sure on the details, but they're the the top four teams that you can see. And they're not too far away from what we're seeing, kind of obviously the trends with Incineroar, 
Tolga kiss. Um, there's a lot more Cinderace though um, in, in this top four than there is in the uh, the rest of the world's top four, uh, which is interesting. And I wonder if it's point on it. I mean, Japan is much more, or at least that diverse. Is, well, they're and they're also a lot more used to the best of one format. Very true. Yeah, that's so. True. Whereas Facts. the rest of us are very much like a best of three format. Usually, up until obviously COVID hit and we, we've started doing things a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything you want to mention about this kind of top cut kunal before we move on from it? Um, so I think it... it's pretty interesting that we see a lot more Cinderace here and that Sun happened to win the event. I think that that is like not an accident. Um, I, I think that the reason also that we didn't see a lot of Cinderace in North America is that it's very weak to uh, Sun teams on average. And mm -hmm. It, it doesn't seem that way, right? Because Cinderace has Airstream, it has it can run Pyroball, and those both destroy the Venusaur. Um, yeah. But Cinderace is also pretty vulnerable to sleep. It's pretty vulnerable to teams that can set up Trick Room, which some yeah. you know some teams generally carry their Dusclops. Mm, um, yeah. It's not like that good versus Togekiss. Um, and then one one of the big things I think I don't have uh, the first place Japan that's paced, but. Incineroar on Sun Teams is very good versus Cinderace as well. Because if you carry Burning Jealousy, the Cinderace has, like, it just can't Dynamax in front of the Incineroar. Yeah. Right? right? Otherwise, your Venusaur answer is just burned and then you lose. Yeah. Or their only option is to just stay a fire type, which is usually not all that great in the face yeah. of Incineroar and probably whatever you have next to it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that's some really good points there. We'll come back to that in a minute because we just got a question from Dinkadonk. Uh, did you guys go over the ladder system, how the ladder system works? Should I play all 45 games? Well, I know if I've uh, made the cut. So we did briefly talk about this a little bit earlier on and, and the different rating zones around the world and what kind of is a reasonable uh, rating to get to know that you're going to be probably qualified we kind of said a bench of 1700 would be probably safe across every rating zone um but you could probably go as low as uh, 1680 the us probably an, an easy number uh europe 1700 1680 1700 and then the other rating zones are a little bit lower um if you're in oceania i think what did we say it was like 1300 1200 I'm messing <laughs> yeah oh. but yeah generally you don't need to play all 45 games uh unless you you need to unless you're struggling at the end and you need to get to a bit of a higher rating then I don't really feel like you need to finish all 45 games um unless you want to for fun and just see where you end up of course that's always um something to think about there as well um but getting back to uh, what we you were saying kunal i think you make an extremely good point um and you know the one thing that was mentioned earlier on in the uh the top cut from our players cup was that there was literally no venusaur at all in the, in the top eight but you see when you move across to japan obviously they, they there's a venusaur sitting at the top and like you say amongst all of these cinderace and uh, and a single dragapult, I guess. Um, the use of dragapult actually, or the lack of the use of dragapult, um, surprises me quite a lot. Um, You'll notice that all four still have Incineroar, though, and yeah, this is everywhere. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, this is true. So the the lonely and deedy there, but um, yeah, I mean, do you think this team here? On, on the top is kind of uh, maybe an insight of what's to come in in the, the qualifying event, possibly, and what teams will do very well in this qualifying event? Or do you think it's just kind of a, a one-off where they've they've built a very solid team and and that's, that's that, and we're not really going to see um, the success rate of Sun too much more than, than what it has been here? I mean, having played a very similar team to that for most of this format. I think that you are going to see some of it. It's really going to matter though about how well you can play it because it's like Kunal said with that team, like there's not a whole lot of mistakes to be made when you're playing that team. So to jump on it now is, would be a mistake if you're not like super familiar with it. Mm. Yeah. So I think um, that team is pretty interesting because 
a lot of sun teams don't like they're built very differently they have they generally have the dust clops or the hatterin with the trick room mode um yeah and we, I, I just i just posted a paste in the private chat of what like when i hear the team when, when i hear the term vgc 20 series 5 sun team like this is the six pokemon with the sets that i think of okay let me what i think is the standard I'll just pull that up. Okay, no, I won't be one second. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so we got the Torkoal, the uh, GMAX Venusaur, mm -hmm. Dusclops, the Tyranitar, Togekiss, and Charizard. So, yeah, very, very strong. And I think as well, like, yeah, it does. That's kind of what's conjured up in my mind when I think to Series series 5. Um you know, yeah, I always cool. think back to because uh, I watched a lot of James Beck's run uh, when he was trying to get to number one on the ladder with with the the kind of the build, this build almost mm -hmm. very similar. You definitely and, have yeah. to be prepared for the variations on that too. Like you're yeah. not always going to have body press yawn Torkoal. Like some of them, like like for example, like on mine that uses Hattering to set Trick Room, like it's just a straight up offensive Torkoal because that is part of my follow me like Clefairy PZ answer or Cinderace answer, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, yeah, right. And, and it's a it's variation. Really how this team, this like quote unquote standard Sun team, differs from the team that won uh, the Japan tournament, right? Where mm -hmm. that team didn't even include any kind of Trick Room mode; they just had Togekiss and Urshifu, yep. and they said, "Yeah, I'm I have offense, and I'm going to use my offense to beat you." And that's, yeah. you know, that was the, the goal of that team. Um, I think a lot of the Sun teams that you're going to see are going to be closer to the one, to, to the pace with Dusclops, uh, yeah. in that they want to have the Trick Room mode and they want to generally have like a Tyranitar, Rhyperior, maybe a Gigalith that will excel in that Trick Room. Yeah, and absolutely. That's mostly for the Sun Mirror as well. Mm. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like having, uh, I mean, and you have to be weary of stuff like all of a sudden seeing like Spec Zard with Heat Wave just like wipe out your Trick Room mode. I mean, that's why Dusclops is a little more common than like Hatterene per se, um, just because you don't want to get wiped out by spread attacks. I mean, I do really love that variation of team. There, I say I love it. I hate going up against it, but um, I, I love using it because. Um, it, it's just it's the whole idea of having the multiple modes on your team and um it, it you know like gives off the bait of oh look i'm a super hardcore sun team or something like that but then the dustlops and tyranitar mode is just so scary to go up against if you don't have the correct answer and if your opponent has played you into that position where you can't do anything because they've just got Togus there as well if it's scope lens i think that one was scope lens wasn't it yeah. um mm. yeah well there you go um it could just go ahead and just boost itself it it's just you got multiple like it's just so many good pokemon on a team that you know you don't originally think that oh, okay they mix and match well but they actually do because you just got that flexibility um on going about your play and they're just all such really good ones mm. you know like yeah. most of them being not most of them being banned but well, i mean yeah three of them aren't they well, i say most oh, of the team. ndd and yeah 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 pretty much all of them but, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's again that's like if you if you look at like the ndd version of that team or whatever i mean to me that's where it really had the strength for sun being able to block the fake outs and stuff like that change terrain in the face of rillaboom um offered a lot of lead options you know um like NDD Venusaur was a real option to lead. I had Scarf Urshifu on my team so that I could U-turn out into stuff um, and take advantage of Sun really fast so I could have dual options as far as what I might see coming my way. Now, it meant that I had to rely on Sleep Powder more. So on my team, you saw stuff like Wide Lens because I, I had some big game plans that were absolutely dependent upon me hitting a Sleep Powder. And so it was more worth it to me to be able to hit it than it was for me to be able to do damage with it. Um, but should we should probably move off of Sun because we we've, we've talked a lot about Sun already <laughs> today. <laughs> foreshadowing. Yeah, <laughs> foreshadowing. Yeah. yeah, perhaps, man, perhaps. <laughs> okay. If before we move away from Sun, I will just say if you guys had to let's say name two Pokemon, name two Pokemon for our, our viewers at home. Um that you feel are best suited to to kind of matching up against the the that standards 
Sun team, the Titar Charizard. You just had to name two, and that's quite difficult. But like off the top of your head, if you could only bring two and it was your choice, what which two would it be? I'll give my answer at the end. Um I would bring Incineroar and one of Dragapult or Gudra. If the only matchup I had to beat was Sun, those would be my two brains. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. It's a nice answer. That's that's absolutely fair. Um, yeah, I'm gonna kind of agree with Kunal. Um, Snarl, especially against uh, that team, has has had a lot of success. Especially Snarl with resists to what that team is. So, or what what kind of damage it can put out. Um, as far as picking a second one with it, I mean, nobody really likes to see the mirror of Titar versus Titar, but Titar is decent against Sun. Um, it would probably be one of my personal picks if I were going to try and go up against it. Yeah. And part of the reason why it was on my own team. I'm Costa. gonna have to do the same. I'm sorry. It's just <laughs> Gudra because I, I was using Gudra a lot in um the Euro Cup and it, it's just it's such a bulky mon that mm. you really don't want to go up against if especially you run that kind of core cool, um of a team because uh it just has, for example, you could have the Incineral variation. You could have the Comfies, um, which just have Ally Switch. They've got the floral, floral Healing. They've got, you know, all of that priority, Trick Room. I'd probably just say Comfy and Gudra, just because it adds a bit of shenanigans to it as well. Um, you could either go Witness Policy Gudra, or you could go AV and try to go and dig a drain into Sap Sipper Gudras. To try to go, you can even have mixed Gudra. That's the thing about Gudra. You can mm. both run special and um, physical. So um, I think it's just, it was so good. I was loving Gudra because it just got rid of all of my sun issues. And um, it's just such a solid mon when going into that matchup. But obviously, there, you know, Incineral is just such a good option, um, as you can see from the top cut as well. And with everything going by, these people knew what they were doing. It was yeah. full of them. So don't expect not to see Incineroar again. No, definitely. So, um, before, before I hear your answer, I actually want to add one more Pokemon. That okay. I think, I think that I have not seen anybody except for Fevzi mention this Pokemon. And okay. That, I'm Safety thinking something goggles, too. Safety goggles Rotom Heat is mm. incredible yeah. against Sun. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good because pick. At, same thing. Venusaur cannot touch it. Charizard cannot touch it. Mm. Torkoal cannot touch it. Togekiss cannot touch it, right? Like, you have the four Sun Pokemon completely beat by Goggles Rotom Heat. Yeah, if you need something that specifically answers just Sun, that's a mm -hmm. very solid choice. Yeah, and definitely, I do. Is, Rotom Heat is also just good in general. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's a lot better than people give it credit for because it beats Amoongus as well. Um, you know, the electric coverage is solid. If you have speed control, it's good versus Primarina, right? If you get a nasty plot off, um, mm -hmm. it's pretty solid versus Lapras as well for the same reason. Uh, it's, you know, it's like fire coverage is just generally very, very good. Electric coverage is very good. Uh, setting electric terrain with your goggles Pokemon so your other Pokemon can't go to sleep. Um, and I mean, I mean, I think we all know like why Rotom is such just like a generally good Pokemon, right? It has great stats. It has like a generally pretty good move pool um it's been good across the board for many many formats yeah yeah but also like it doesn't need much support you can run it bulky you can run it fast uh it's mm -hmm. it's yeah. a very very much a standalone pokemon that you can slot into a lot of teams i think it's mm. true because you've got will-o-wisp as well you've got the speed control aspect of it with electro web you've got options with it and even ally switch if you're that daring but in the comp that you're saying um it would be more as just being that standalone mon that it is itself the counter to so many mons or should i say archetypes yeah i love rotom here i think it's such a good shout my answer was going to be incineroar and gudra there but uh kunal obviously coming out with that straight away so it looks like i'm copying you but i am honestly not i think gudra is a great shout i think uh, from our discussions already i think you can make a core of Incin bravery and Gudra, and then it's a good starting point if you want to go kind of anti-meta at the minute, but um, the, the the final three 
pieces are uh, up to yourself to put together but things like rotten heat yeah definitely a pokemon you know it's always a pokemon that's that little bit on the the side of an anti-meta pokemon you know you don't see it generally we saw fevzy play a really strong team with it actually on ladder in series five and he did very well with it he was constantly in the top 50 on his streams and things like that with it so it's a good example of that pokemon uh coming in and disrupting those sort of kind of popular cores that we're seeing and especially if there's not the dust clops there to kind of support those teams they don't really have too many options there uh to really to get rid of it and um you know you can build up around that and make it a very strong uh threat for your opponent um we've got uh infested tenno uh, i also need to give colin a big shout out for the raid thank you so much colin and uh welcome to everyone coming over uh for those that you are new uh we've got kunal we've got costa and Krim. we are covering players cup uh preparation for players cup two starting this friday so hopefully it's uh entertaining for you guys we've kind of been through the bare bones of the, the tournament the previous players won um results things and we're just discussing teams and and best ways to kind of approach the tournament in general right now um so next on the agenda let's have a quick look so we've covered um sun sand dragapult togekiss we haven't really touched on too much we've kind of briefly talked about drekas or covenite uh gastro mm -hmm. stuff um lapras we've briefly talked about pz we have mentioned but we haven't went in depth um might be worth going into pz because you know at the minute as well it's obviously with series five um kind of finish series six is the main format at the minute obviously we're not playing that in players cup but porygon z a huge threat at the minute in series six do you kind of see that carrying on into into players cup this weekend is it something that we're going to have to be well prepared for or do you think not so much i think like with the inclusion again of like things like tyranitar I wouldn't be worried about it as much as I, was, I would be if I was playing Series 6. If that would be my my first thing um, to think about. You know, you've got a lot of different options now with the banned Pokemon allowed again. And I think they pair up and match up against things like PZ that have kind of been let loose a little bit in Series 6. Uh, they match up a lot better against them and kind of take away uh, a little bit of the anxiety about playing the, those sort of Pokemon that can kind of explode and uh, go to town on you if, you're, if you t make a wrong move or a little bit unprepared for them. So um, I think that if there are only two teams that you prep for, for player scout, they have to be Sun and Porygonzi. I think those are the two teams that require prep beforehand. That you are not, you can't go into to the IC and say, "If I face this, I'm just going to figure out how to play my way out of it during the game." <laughs> like you have to know exactly. What you're yeah. We all yeah. laugh because we all know it's true. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Porygon Z teams are generally, uh, you know, they're Porygon Z, Clefairy. They generally have Incineroar. They generally have Urshifu. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them have like a Pokemon like Talonflame or like Whimsicott that will give you that priority speed control. Um, yeah. And so I, the struggle for a lot of people is how do you break through this Porygon Z and Clefairy lead where Clefairy has Friend Guard, it has Follow Me, and it can even protect, right? And just mm -hmm. like keep that Friend Guard around longer for the Porygon Z. And then Porygon Z is lowering your speed with Max Strike. And then, you know, when you finally manage to kill one of these Pokemon, the Urshifu comes in your Pokemon are lower speed and it, it just gets to, you know, throw attacks into whatever it wants to. Yeah. And so one, one of the ways that we saw people counter this for Player's Cup is uh, by using a lot of Ally Switch Ghost Pokemon. So Ally Switch Dustclops, Ally Switch Dragon Ball. And Duck Pond in particular uh, is a player from Italy. He placed a uh, top four in the European Player's Cup. And one of his main ways to beat Porygon Z was Ally Switch Dragon Ball where you lead Dragapult plus, I think it was Lapras that he used, or uh, I forget which Pokemon. Um, and his method of beating Porygon Z was that you ally switch. And if the Porygon Z predicts the ally switch, right, then, uh, you know, they they have to make a hard read. Either they predict the ally switch or they go for a neutral move like Max Dark to try and cover for it. Yeah. And going for a Max Dark doesn't, you know, it's, it's not generating the momentum that they need out of Porygon Z's Max turns. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's a very interesting yeah. way of it. I, I think that uh, some of the other common ways to try and counter it is get anything with a solid resist. Like um, I think Stu even mentioned it in the comments, like versus Sand. So Titar, um, 
I think is, is not, is not a bad play against it. Um, maybe to rally it on in some ways, I think snarl is another good way to handle it though. Um, I think that if you go in, if you lean into PZ and you start snarling right off the bat, it does kind of nerf mm. up to the point of where you can kind of play around it. But you know, n- none of those are really like the best answer to PZ, right? I think Lee had a really interesting way of attacking it by just deleting the Clefairy with uh, like a life orb Gengar and then having Urshifu sitting there next to it to just close combat and rip out the PZ's heart. So, yeah, I think it's when I've been doing that though on series six, I feel like it's not something you could really get away with in series five. If I'm completely honest with you, I feel like you get away with it a lot more in series six because there are a lot less archetypes to kind of prepare for in series six than there are in series five so i think that that helps you kind of attack that combination um a little bit easier um and a bit more freer but like where i was playing like yeah life orb gengar and then the urshifu next to it where i could always get the the ko onto the clefairy mm-hmm. um unless they were ridiculously uh invested in special defense and then and then obviously like banded urshifu is always going to pick up the knockout on pz so it kind of cleans up that lead without very much resource but I think because of the slots that you, I mean, you could maybe do it, but it's it's kind of fitting in something that can consistently knock out the Clefairy in one turn without setup and allow maybe Urshifu to do the same in that respect. It's always something to look at. I just think it's maybe harder to implement in Series 5 in a, in a solid team build um, where you're covering lots of different archetypes that w- we're aware of than maybe a smaller pool of archetypes that you've got in series in series six. So I don't know if it's it, it's definitely a way of looking at it, but I don't think it would be as easy to do that maybe. And and I think you're really looking at like like Kunal said about um, a player from Italy who it was utilizing. It's a smart way of doing it. Utilize an ally switch to kind of be annoying against an annoying offensive Pokemon. And and you're not really limiting your opponent's options there. They're going to have to make a read. And if they get that read wrong, then, you know, 50 ta- 50% of the time, you're going to come out on the better side of that. And that that's good, you know, without having to specifically prepare for that team. You've got a game plan. And, you know, most of the time, you're going to come out on the better side of it, especially in a best of one format. So that's the kind of thing. The, I think the smart way of looking at it, but there's nothing wrong with looking at like a just an all-out offensive mode as well. If you've got if you've got the the room in your team to do that, then definitely sure, go yeah, for it. No. But it's an interesting way to go about it. I mean, personally, I prefer trick room, and you know, like then I can sit in there like with the team like I had, <clears throat> and just follow me away and utilize eruptions or expanding force, et cetera, et cetera. And then that just really eats away at it, regardless of the friend guard or the Clefairy standing there clicking, follow me, um, makes it much more difficult. And then PZ, every time it's dropping, whatever it's hitting is benefiting you while you're sitting in that trick room. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. We've got Stu there saying trick room PZ is something to be aware of, though. Dropping electric coverage is certainly a turn one play to be if conscious of. If they call of. it and they're, they're going to use it and they have it, then yeah. It'd be yeah. interesting to know the stats on um, trick room PZ these days because I'm not sure how many are running it, but it is definitely a thing. Mm. I mean, I definitely know that. I, I was still running it. And it's just because you have that flexibility of being able to say listen i'm not just going to go and drop your uh, speed straight away i'm just going to set up for my trick room mon in the back it could be ferrothorn to start setting up right. if the, the opponent doesn't have any ferrothorn answers or it could be i don't know i don't even know it could be any trick room sweeper but um i was going to say going back onto the talk of pz i've been trying to deal with it as well with um like you said canal you were talking about the italian player I've been trying to use a, a Lolan Marowak because at least you cover for lightning rod, at least, should I say, the electric type coverage there. And that's always a threat because you can have ally switch there, but at the same time, you have to be conscious about the huge amount of damage output that Marowak actually has. So it's kind of a gamble. I've been pairing that up with, for example, like a Corviknight, where Corviknight doesn't care about speed drops. It's just going to be dropping your speed instead. And it has a good matchup against Corviknight, uh, against Clefairy as well. Um, so there are, there are venues to it, but it's all down to if you want to go direct into getting rid of your opponent's uh, Clefairy and then the PZ, or if you want to just slow it down like Krim was saying, 
which is a really good strat as well. You could waste the Dynamax turns too with that, let's say, for example, Arcanine, which outspeeds and go for the Snarls. Yeah, I think that's a really that's a really good example as well, Costa, to to just kind of get across to players that there are it doesn't need to be like one way for dealing with this this particular like mm -hmm. pairing, you know. There are like innovative ways always to like dealing with certain threats. And I think the example there is great with the, the Corviknight and the, the Lola Marowak is really unique where you're kind of having that ally switch support. But as well as that, you know, with the mirror armor ability on the Corvic Knight, you're really kind of punishing the PZ if it goes for anything. Well, basically any attack, honestly, you know, and yeah. no matter what situation you're putting it in an uncomfortable position and that's a way of dealing with it. And, you know, those two Pokemon fit nicely into a really solid build, you know, uh, whereas maybe more well, my point before was, Krim, that I don't know if Gengar would fit into many. <laughs> well, no, series, just, just as an example things. of something but yeah, that yeah. the Clefairy right away, no, whatever, no, whatever I, you want to use in that slot. <laughs> no, I know what you were getting at, yeah. Um, but yeah, nice examples, I think. Um, and really interesting, Kunal, I'll come back to your original point there, saying that obviously Sun and then um, PZ are the, the two teams that you would definitely 100% prepare for going into this tournament. Um, I think one of the things that I... I was personally looking at when you look at the um, the top cut of uh, the, the the previous players cup. I'll just pull that up here for us to take a quick look at um, again, just for reference here. Um, I'm thinking, okay, Dragapult, Incineroar, um, Togekiss, and instantly I'm like, okay, Lapras does an amazing job here. Can we see? Are we going to see? Are a lot of players going to be thinking that and thinking we have touched slightly on on offensive? Tailwind Lapras, are we going to be maybe looking at quite a few of those teams popping up with maybe the Talonflame replacing the Whimsicott there because it gives you the coverage <laughs> against Rillaboom and um, uh, what, Venusaur. What yeah, you know, yeah. so. Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think it, it could de it could basically ha happen in that case because um, Talonflame, it can also have quick guard access as well if you want to get really cheeky and yeah. shut down any priority moves too because overall Talonflame is really good. Um, you just need to be able to understand when to bring it and if you have to bring it in the back as well um, because it, it's a good mon to go up against, especially imagine if it has like safety goggles, uh, good luck trying to stop it if, for example, you try to cheekily Dynamax it. Who knows? Like, you can just, you can jump uh, with Talonflame. It gives you that access to try to grab momentum as long as you're in a good spot. But obviously, this is Series 5. Talonflame has a bit of a better time than Series 6 compared to Series 5. But um, it's still a viable option, to be honest. Yeah, I think I would also expect to maybe see a little bit more of the special T-Flame. Um, I, well, I mean... Lots of people will be running Flare Blitz, but I feel like the higher up on ladder I went, the more I saw special fire move T-Flame. So it was like mixed. I'm not saying full special here. Um, I think that that does make use of some of its abilities because, I mean, you intimidate a Talon Flame and it, it becomes pretty worthless pretty fast. And Incineroar is a very popular Pokemon. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I, think, uh, I also think that while Lapras looks pretty good, uh, one of the big issues with Lapras is that sand is very popular, right? And Lapras is not good versus Titar. Mm. Um, or Colossal. Or, or Colossal, Rilla. Right? Or <laughs> Rilla Boom is the big one that I was going to bring up because yeah. a lot of the teams yeah. that Lapras is good against. Uh, Rilla Boom is, you know, if a Rilla Boom is on that team, you have to play against it very differently. You're not able to use Lapras to its full potential. Mm. And so... Uh, if you do plan to use Lapras, my advice would be to make sure that you have specific targeted answers to Rillaboom, to Titar, uh, maybe to like Excadrill, right? These Pokemon that can tank through Lapras's attacks and, you know, stall them out. Um, yeah. Because that's that's really the problem with Lapras, right? Especially offensive is it's Lapras does not have the best offensive stats. It really doesn't. And so no. something that is very important for it is being able to get kills while it can uh, while it's dynamaxed because once mm -hmm. dynamax ends it has a very hard time securing those kills mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. relying on hydro pump it might be relying on blizzard it might be relying on thunder right because mm -hmm. it needs the, it needs the base power of those moves for its dynamax to do enough damage yeah 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's only additional benefit is that it can set up for some other things in the back with either Thunder to stop sleep as Max Electric or setting up Rain to boost something like Dracovish um, and obviously Veil being the other big one. But I mean, it it's only going to carry you so far. So yeah. like Pernal's 100% right. Like if you're, if you're not going to plan, uh, I mean, this this goes across the board too. Like we just talked about all these PZ counters. Like if you're going to build a PZ team and go into this and you're not going to prepare yourself for what we just discussed as yeah. far as PZ counters, then maybe that's not the PZ team to be running. <laughs> you got to be ready for whatever is coming your way for the main portion of your team. My hot take for the Lapras, if you do plan on going running with the Lapras would be to try to fit in a cool night. I think it, really does um, complement the sand matchup as well as the Rillaboom uh, matchup for the Laprises because especially if you have like a bolt up, maybe an iron defense set, but I'd probably lean more towards a bolt up set. It just gives you that viability to just go ahead and 1v3 your opponent if those are the three mons he has left in the back because especially if you have Aurora Veil set up for yourself, it's just going to do everything for you. Um because that's what I've been experiencing, and it is such a good feeling. That's a really good shout. I like that a lot. I think, yeah, like you say, you're all about the Corviknight tonight. I Costa. am. I am. I'm on the Corviknight train. I so <laughs> am. <laughs> it's not a bad Pokemon either, especially no, at the minute. I think with the, the mirror armor, it's it's very good. It's a good way to counteract Incineroar to a certain extent, you know. Um, so, it's a, yeah, I like that combination a lot, and it gives, it gives Lapras players or people that are thinking about lapras a lot to think about going into the event this weekend um all right well that is really good like what have we got left to discuss we talked about quite a lot so far it's been really good i just want to say thanks again to all you guys for coming out and uh, obviously everyone that's in the stream tonight it's uh, it's really great to be able to do this sort of thing and uh, hopefully it's useful to you all and uh, getting the insights from these great players that we've got with us tonight obviously kunal costa and krim um and just getting a bit of a, a headspace around getting prepared for um going into players cup to this weekend so cinderace have we really talked too much about cinderace yet we haven't talked a great deal about it we saw um how well it did in the um japan cup we briefly talked about it uh there obviously the um the japan players cup was um but we did discuss some counters too yeah do you expect it to be quite popular? I think I probably expect it to be one of the the more seen Pokemon this weekend, I would say. Um, but yeah. again, um, so, sorry. So I think Cinderace is going to be definitely popular. It's you know it's one of the go to Pokemon for players who are trying to play the IC and get to their rating as fast as they can, right? And it's a very reliable Pokemon in terms of doing that. You don't have to play long games. You can get through all fifteen of your games in you know like a couple hours. Because Cinderace just, as I said earlier, just generates offense every turn. Mm -hmm. You know, your Cinderace is always putting pressure on your opponents, and they're forced to deal with it instead of playing a positioning game. And yeah. so, just you know, by that merit alone, it's naturally going to be a Pokemon that a lot of players just kind of flock to because this Pokemon is pretty easy to use. You know, I'm going to send this Pokemon out, and I'm going to do damage, and I'm not going to have to worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think a lot of what also makes Cinderace good in kind of a similar vein to Dragapult is uh, oh, Cinderace is very, very reliant on the Pokemon around it to take advantage of what it's doing. Yeah. And so Pokemon that you have to watch out for are Bisharp, are Milotic, are um, like Rillaboom can take advantage of it very well. Uh, and so these are all like, you know, when, when prepping for Cinderace, you have to think about, first of all, how are you answering the Cinderace on the lead matchup? If, if someone leads Cinderace into you, what are you leading into it? And how are you going to stop it from snowballing off of its three Dynamax turns? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then second of all, you know, how are you going to deal with their their secondary Pokemon? If their Cinderace clicks Airstream, how are you going to avoid dying to the Bisharp Assurance that's coming after it? Or how are you going to avoid uh, letting the endgame Milotic sweep you? Right, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so uh, I think a very good team to look at this uh, in this case is I uh, just linked in the private chat. It's the team that uh, John Evans and Nails used in the uh, first yeah. part and yeah. Jody used it as well. Yeah. You going to pull that up, Lee? Yeah, I'm just going to oh, cool. grab that now. 
and get the screen share back on. It's going to say a bit impatient there, Trim. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> God, sorry. Give, me, give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay trigger fingers yeah okay so we got yeah this is a i i know this team um really nice team actually i think addy's got a really great video with um jonathan and uh nils on uh on the actual team and going through it in detail so definitely uh check that out uh we we linked it earlier and i'll link it again at the end of the the uh the stream for you guys to check out but we've got the melotic the grassy seed there the um Rillaboom Assault Fest, the Choice Band Tyranitar. That's a really nice pick. I do like that. I think it's a bit of a surprise factor as well. Uh, the the Life Orb, Cinderace, uh, Incineroar, Clefairy, and that makes up the six. So, yeah. Do you want to, have you got anything you want to mention about this team, Canal? Because you're quite familiar with this one as well, I think. Yeah. So, this, so uh, generally, Cinderace teams are very focused on the lead map, you know, getting the, the lead right, generating enough offense to just sweep the game. This team actually does, uh, it, it uses Cinderace in a very different way. It uses Cinderace in such a way to play like a, a more positioning oriented game, not Dynamaxing super early, just kind of getting the perfect board position, taking off kills, like getting picks where you can, and then mm -hmm. endgaming very well with either Cinderace or Titar or Milotic. Um, and so one of the main ways that we see that is the Clefairy has Sing, right? Yeah. And Sing is very good in this game. Uh, because mm. you have you have a fifty five percent chance of just disabling your Pokemon your opponent's Dynamax, right? Mm. Uh, it's just gone, and then and the causing them to rage as well. Yeah, the instant has burning jealousy. Which, ally, yeah, this this increases is burning jealousy, which uh, neutralizes the opponent's offensive pressure as well. Uh, Milotic does that as well, right? Your opponents are kind of forced not to use their primary Z or their primary max moves against you. Um, yeah, Rillaboom is you know good at repositioning, good at doing chip damage, so that the Tyrantar can come in and click Choice Band Rock Slide, or the Cinderace mm. can come in and Dynamax later. I think that helping hand is a really cool thing too on Melodic, especially next to Cinderace. I considered the same thing because you yeah. there's a lot actually a lot of KOs that you can pick up having that helping hand, and lots of times you do want to be able to lead the Melodic with the Cinderace for fear of the fact that they may lead something with Intimidate, right? So um, I think that that's a, a really nice tech to see on that. Yeah. And Melodic with the Rillaboom as well, or the Milotic gets the Grassy Seed benefits. Yeah. It doesn't have, it, it's not carrying the Coil, but it's still getting that yeah. defense boost, right? Um, yeah. That's huge. And helping him Grassy Glide is hitting, you know, it's hitting Lapras, it's hitting Rotoms, it's hitting Primarina, and it's taking out a lot of threats to this team very, very well. Yeah, uh, the choice helping hand plus choice band Titar is killing the dust clops. It's you know it's hurting the P two, and so this team is able to uh, like hold steady in front of a lot of common cores that are trying to generate offense as fast as possible, and that's a very different take on Cinderace that I think is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Just it kind of shows that it's a momentum. It's kind, of, it's kind of like stalls out the momentum from the opponent's side. It's like you, you're just trying to scout out with your initial leads, for example. I mean, obviously dependent on matchup, but um, I feel like, like you said, now it's kind of have Cinderace in the back. As long as you've gone ahead and you've kind of weakened your opponent's Pokemon to start off with or just kind of force them to get into a position where they get caught out from Cinderace Dynamax in the back. Yep. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the time when players see Cinderace and team preview, they're they're instantly thinking about leading against the Cinderace as well. So automatically you leading it in the back uh kind of gives you the advantage straight away because if you can deal with those lead combinations that are meant to be the answers to Cinderace, then uh they've got no chance to come back late game with the Cinderace to come in and with its Dynamax turn still to go, you know. It's 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 a nice alternative way of looking at using Cinderace rather than just chucking it in up front and then clicking the um, Gigantamax or Dynamax button, turn one and going from there. Even though that is an option and it does work sometimes, you know, but um, I like I like the flexibility this team's got and obviously the defensive kind of build that it's got to it as well. So, uh, yeah, it's a really nice, nice example and probably a good one to look at and study at. I'll throw it out in the chat for you guys uh, if you would like to check out that poker pace there um, a bit more in detail, but definitely one to take note of and uh, some of the ideas in this build. Um, really good to 
to talk about. I don't know if there's much else to really mention about Cinderace. You know, I think that kind of sums yeah, it up pretty well. We there was one more team I wanted to go through, and that was the team that Yuri mm -hmm. used in the uh, the Champions Invitational right before. Yeah, the yeah that's a valid point. Yeah, it's the other side of Cinderace, right, where you're yeah very offensive. You're trying to do as much damage as possible, mm -hmm. uh, and I like that as well. Uh, the page yeah, stack that. the support a lot too. I mean, a hundred percent with that team. Yeah. Like whatever, you, whatever you're clicking, pretty much except for maybe like Max Flair or whatever, is helping your team almost no matter what you have on the field. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Uh, and I mean, this team like it won the the kickoff invitational for good reason, right? It has yeah very very offensive uh, Pokemon on it. It has Woodhammer on the Rillaboom instead of Grassy Glide. It has the Bisharp with, uh, I believe, being the Focus Sash. So it has, you know, more longevity on the yeah, field. It, it has the Assurance as the Sash. Um, the Togekiss was, uh, it, it had Dazzling Gleam and Heat Wave, actually. It didn't have Airstream. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. it was the very rare. So it was a more supportive Togekiss, actually, on this team. Um, but this, you know, you know, it's another, it's like the perfect example of the other kind of Cinderace team that I was mentioning, where... yeah. Uh, the the one that we looked at prior is more defensive and more uh, gain momentum over time, hmm. and this one is like I'm going to win this turn, and you <laughs> have to, it's on you to stop me. Right? And I yeah. mean, it's got the dust collapse pre marina setup too that we've seen a lot of people use to to great success. So I mean, he didn't necessarily have to be running Cinderace all the time. There was always yeah. that threat in the back, depending on what he was looking at, staring down yep. the other six. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, and it's just you know this team has so many mid ground Pokemon. It has the Rillaboom, it has the Primarina, it has the Togekiss that don't really care that much about the speed control or the the state of the board. They yeah, come in, they're you know they're able to do their thing, and that's why they mesh so well with both the Cinderace and the Dusclops mode, where mm -hmm. they can go fast or they can go slow. It doesn't matter because they don't care. Yeah, yeah, it's that multi mode kind of flexibility that. The, the teams that you see on the top usually have because it just allows you to reposition yourself dependent on the situation and the board play being able to switch from one mode rapidly to another and um because yeah you see the hyper offensive kind of like state of play of it with the combination of the cinderace and the bishop but then you've got the bit more you've got the dust lops in the back or in the front should i say um and the toad kiss set up uh paired onto it so it's really interesting to see these teams, how well they perform. And there's a lot of thought put behind it, which, it, and you can just see the synergy between them. It just really works. It, it honestly does. As long as you position yourself appropriately and you see what you need to do ahead of uh, going into the game. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think big. leads are like, well, I mean, they've always been important, but super, super, yeah. super important in this format. I mean, like, you do not want to sacrifice yourself down to by leading something that could potentially be a com completely blow up in your face if they set put out just a completely different lead that you didn't expect you like hot counted to, yeah yeah mm -hmm, exactly so i mean you do kind of have to split yourself like down that line to be able to handle whatever you're going to handle that's why i am a big fan of like teams that can kind of slow down um a number of these common cores and then you try and dynamax later as opposed to just trying to go for the kill right off the bat mm, yeah i think a team that we haven't really talked too much about is kind of just this one uh davida's team with the the p2 the dragapult prim Cineral, rillaboom and tracking it's kind of like your standard good stuff's team uh, i know i mentioned it earlier with Alistair's build with a bit of a variation on his uh there it is with the Incineroar there and I, that was a team I really liked but for consistency alone I think this team is one to definitely be aware of going into to this weekend I think especially with the Terrakion uh, that does give you some nice options against things like Charizard um obviously Tyranitar as well um and and certain Urshifu variants um Okay. that we may, may may not see you know so uh that's definitely a team i think uh, a lot of players need to be because it's it's so versatile i think it's probably one of the more versatile teams that we've got in the format at the minute at least that particular build it feels like it's got uh the tools to kind of answer most things in the format or at least that's in my mind it feels like that 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 way you know what i mean 
I think that it's worth mentioning too that you've noticed on a number of these teams going down too that you've got the combo of um, Incineroar and Rillaboom, which does allow you to do things like throw in. It, it allows you to get in fake outs despite NDD, which I think is pretty important in a number of ways. And mm-hmm. having double fake out in general has obviously worked out for a number of these teams going down this list of top teams. Yeah. We just had a question there. Uh, did uh, it's from Nate B. Chill? So thanks, Nate. Uh, did Magnazone get mentioned covered already? We haven't actually talked at all about Magnazone yet. So be interesting to maybe uh, throw it out to you guys to see what your thoughts are on Magnazone. I think we're going into series, the end of series five on the ladder, Magnazone was really starting to kind of ramp up its its usage, and you're seeing a lot more of it at the end of series five, just before the ban list was announced. So it yeah. kind of felt like the momentum of it was about to kind of get really like kind of explode almost, but uh, it didn't obviously get the chance with the ban list coming into effect, so we didn't really get to see the most out of it, unfortunately. But do you think we'll see much of it going in? into uh this this weekend just want to say one thing before i felt like when i was gonna go for it so i apologize um <laughs> we saw japan as in due uh due fashion as they always do um they're ahead of the game we saw them in their japan in the tournament that they had that it placed the um, top four i think second um Magna no, you are correct yeah yeah mm-hmm. so it's a very very interesting pokemon to yeah. bring as long as it doesn't face sand but then it has the ways that it could go around it. i think especially in takuto's team uh he might have had a babiri berry on the toad kiss as well mm-hmm. to and he's got, that. yeah he's got double redirection as well to kind of support it as well so that yeah. definitely helps out a bunch doesn't it i think you saw the standard set though when you just pulled it up on peakalytics like i mean it's its main goal is to like flash cannon like max steel boost up defense a whole bunch and then just start going for body presses after the fact. Uh, I'd be interested to see what the number one used item is on it at the moment and and ability for that matter. Yeah, weakness policy sturdy. So, I mean, I've seen that also used effectively in, well, not really effectively, but in the face of a number of different things. Like, so it's, I think it's it, it struggles like, so it's not so great against sun, right? Um, it despite it being able to like thunderbolt to Charizard, I guess, or something like that. But I do think that weakness policy sturdy is an interesting aspect that you'll have to take into account if you're going to see a Magna Zone, because it it then can retaliate. Like if if they don't double target the Magna Zone and they have a Sun team and they just blast away at it, then I'm rather sure that plus two T bolt dro- usually drops whatever Charizards on the field. So that is an option for those people, but. I think its primary function is to just boost its defense with max steals and then to body press after it, it's done being maxed. Yeah, so Magnazone is my favorite Series 5 Pokemon. I think it is one of the strongest Pokemon in Series 5. Um, I think that the best set on it is Grassy Seed with Analytic as yeah, its ability. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And so uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of a player named Bragov. He's you know one of the best pokemon players period right he's one of the best na players constantly Mm -hmm. Um, and so the day after the format was announced he hopped into his chat and he was like yo grassy seed magnon zone is kind of cool and no one really thought about it until before players cup when you know we we started looking at it again uh raga in particular looked at it in context with uh he was running so Inteleon with icy wind and he had a really good on his team so so can tell on plus magnuson obviously very cool um someone mentioned that magnuson is not very good against sand and i actually strongly disagree i think magnuson is an incredible sand matchup because body press is the most broken move tpc or like game freak has ever added to the game that's true um, that's yeah. true that's so true. i think the, the thing that makes magnuson so amazing is that it's able to dynamax very safely in early games and it's able to carry that momentum all the way through the game because steel type is incredible right it, you know it's one of the best defensive typings in the game yeah and so especially when carrying a grassy seed or like weakness policy for example a- and with pokemon like incineroar and arcanine and uh pokemon that are clicking max wormwind you know dropping attacks magnesium is able to stand up to defensive attacks incredibly well uh and so it gets to either like steel spike or just you know click raw uh analytic boosted thunderbolts flash cannons body presses 
and it hits very, very hard. Um, I think that it's just like, you know, if you're looking for a steel type, if you're looking for electric coverage, it's a great Pokemon to have on your team. Uh, and if you compare it with a Rillaboom, I think you're going to get the most value out of it, especially with the analytic ability. Mm. Yeah. The combination just between those two is so nice as well, isn't it? Um, How do you feel you can... about its matchup versus Porygon Z? Uh, it's great versus Porygon Z. So uh, the team that Raghav used, you can find it on Adi's channel. He did an interview with Raghav. Um, actually, I don't think we used Magnetone as part of that matchup. We we ended up using Icy Wind Inteleon plus, uh, like we maxed the Rillaboom and clicked uh, the bug move, the, the bug max move to lower Porygon Z's special attack. But Magnetone is still very good because Porygon Z does not hit it very hard. Uh, mm -hmm. Given that it's you know Magnetone's resisting the electric move, resisting the normal move, Magnetone mm -hmm. is able to steel spike the Clefairy and just kill it, right? Um, and it's also able to use Lightning to hit the Urshifu if Trick Room goes up. Uh, it's able to body press the like potential Tyranitar. Uh, it's just you know it has the coverage is just crazy. Steel electric fighting coverage is crazy. Um, and so I think uh, e even if you, you know, I, I just don't like the weakness policy set, but even if you run that, I, I think Magnuson is definitely a Pokemon to look out for and a Pokemon to consider using. It mm. just has so many good favorable matchups. Togekiss also is one of them. You know, there's not many Pokemon that hit Togekiss very well. And yeah. Magnuson just happens to be one of them that also happens to hit the T Tar. So yeah. I think that's very important. And you have to be scared if you're a Togekiss and in case you proc. A weakness yeah. policy on the magma zone too so you always have that at the back of your head too yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely definitely want to watch out for this weekend and i think we're probably not going to see anything but more magma zone going forward as well i think when more players kind of realize how good it is as a pokemon uh it will probably be flooded and then by that time it'll be time for us to move into series seven so we'll probably not have to worry about it anymore so <laughs> we'll see. But, uh, no definitely a really good point there i think from all of you and i think just highlighting the fact that magnazon such a strong uh pokemon there and with the grassy seed as well it just you know makes it ridiculously strong the analytic as well as really underrated ability the sturdy is really good there but i don't think it necessarily needs it all the time and uh with some you know nice coverage for maybe some more of the threatening ground types that we'll see in the format you you're going to be fine to play around those and really make the most out of magnazon um in in the format anyway so we've got so far incineral bravery magnazon gudra was that the four <laughs> we're kind of slowly building a team up here i'm only messing but they're they're kind of some nice picks that we've mentioned tonight You've probably covered all of our hot takes that we had that were good for the end of this video now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, believe me i have some hot takes <laughs> <laughs> by the way ally switch on magma zone people have to be aware of this as well don't mm. forget okay. does yeah it does get it yeah yeah it, it is one of those yeah yeah, it's good good to point out because I mean you are gonna see that like that randomly. Like that's what I was kind of trying best to touch on earlier, where like there's gonna be surprises because I mean best of one can pull that off, you know. Oh, all the time, like, yeah. Yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna see things that you wouldn't normally expect to see in like a best of three setting that can yeah. perform better because of us being in this format. Yeah, for sure. sure. So Ally Switch, definitely going to be something that we'll be seeing a lot of this weekend for sure. So be prepared for that. Uh, Magnazon, we'll be moving on to Hot Takes soon because we don't have that much longer to go, my friends, because we're getting pretty close to covering most of the things that we wanted to talk about tonight. Um, we've covered, obviously, the Sun uh, team, Sand we've we've talked we haven't talked about directly but we've indirectly talked about them in other calls that are very popular that you'll see a lot of um uh, especially this weekend uh briefly talked about Draco's or Corviknight uh Gastrodon stuff the Lapras we've covered PZ Cinderace um so I don't know if there's any other kind of archetypes that you guys would like to mention before we move on and kind of wrap up before we finish this up today because I feel like we've covered quite a lot of things for what players should be expecting going into this weekend and I think it sets up a lot of um especially the newer players up with the knowledge that they'll need and maybe a few hot takes as well to to for pokemon to look at going into the tournament but uh, if there's any calls we've 
maybe overlooked a little bit or things that we've kind of neglected a little bit it would be uh, he now's a chance to to mention them uh hat and dd is definitely one that i would probably throw up into the mix but um other than that i can't really think of too many other calls that really would stand out for me so rather than cores i think um we like i want to touch on some individual pokemon i think whimsicott is something we haven't really talked about that much uh i think the whole idea of proccing weakness policy on one of your Pokemon is not something that we've talked about too much as well. And so uh, Whimsicott, yeah. obviously, you know, Prankster, it has a huge number of moves. It can run Charm, it can run Fake Tears, it generally carries Tailwind. It's a great support Pokemon. It also gets Helping Hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something that I think people should definitely expect with, like, an offensive Pokemon. Whimsicott plus Lapras uh, is definitely yep. something that you should expect. Um, Whimsicott Duraludon is, you know, it won the first ever 2020 regional, right? Or mm, the first yeah. ever. And you see it a lot know. with some of the other faster ones like Cinderace and PZ too. Like, I mean, just yeah. because it's not on all of those teams doesn't mean that you're not going to see it on some of them for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was Dallas, wasn't it? No. It was, yep. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yep, beat up. Yeah, absolutely. Beat up I mean, well. any, any yeah. kind of self-proc in general, we, yeah, I mean, we haven't talked a ton about that, but... I mean, there's Togekiss is is in this, right? So, I mean, you're going to have follow me out the wazoo. So it's not always the easiest thing to nail off. I think if you're going to be working with teams like that where you're going to self-proc and you don't have a spread move that can do self-procking for you, then you do have to have an answer to the redirection that you're going to want to be able to deal with first and then move on to your self-proc plays later into the game. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because yeah. redirection is going to be everywhere, isn't it? Um, and it and does I mean, get trick room as well. That's on the beat up note too, to like I mean, a lot of people go with Terrakion, but like I think AV Cobalion is definitely a beat up threat that I would be worried about too. I, I'm not sure how big the usage is on it, but AV beat up Koba was a lot of fun for me. I got to play for a little while. Um, Lee's. Uh, colossal um team with sneasel and av cobalion and that was uh that did more work on ladder than i planned on it doing <laughs> yeah. yeah it does a good yeah. job against uh, pz as well that so they got... yeah i mean exactly so not not just the av cobalion but the um i'm probably not even saying that right but the colossal as well i mean both PZ resists to the point of where it can at least hit it back. Um, it can at least survive in front of it. It doesn't make its job any easier. Yeah. I think uh, Kutesh actually uh, used Cobalion in the top, it, like in the finals of Player Cup, in the final bracket. Mm. This team is pretty interesting. Uh, if we want to take a look at that real quick. Yeah, let's bring uh, that in, one up. In general, though, in general, I oh, don't yeah, really expect to see yeah. Cobalion or Verision. I think they're both not very good Pokemon. Outside of like very, worse, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor Verizion. No, I mean, we're kind of on the outskirts of things here, I feel like, at this point. So it was just something I, I felt was worth mentioning while we're talking self proc. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's definitely one of the bigger self proc users, I think. Um, uh, obviously, I think Cole is, is the number one self proc user that I would, I would expect to see getting proc. Yeah. Like this Cole thing. or Tyranitar, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 because you can you can proc that more reliably with spread moves um i i think the individual like it's 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 cool to perhaps have like cole as an option on a team where you know if you feel like you're not going to encounter follow me on your first turn and you've tacked aqua jet onto something or whatever then that could work as as something nice for you but I think predominantly the biggest ones that you're going to see as far as like self procking things are, is exactly what Kunal mentioned. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think Talking something about people should also look out for uh, just to kind of finish this conversation off is no, 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 that's cool, uh, mate. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of the self proc, you know, happens with like dust clubs looking bulldoze on Titar. Mm. I think that something that people should watch out for is procking weakness policy with a faster bulldoze like Arcanine or like maybe mm. even just like looking Earthquake with Exedro. Mm. Right, yeah. weakness yeah. policy Duraludon or weakness policy Tyranitar. I think those are both very strong options as well. Yeah, yeah. they're really nice things and good kind of food for thought for players to think about as well. Yeah. Um, 
what I was going to say, actually, just getting on to Colossal again, um, it's been quite popular recently, but uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Scarf de Urshifu, uh, Rapid Strike? It's a very solid answer for the Colossal teams and kind of shuts them down pretty easily, you know. Got to watch out for the Aqua Jet. Um, I mean, threat, in a similar vein there, of, like, Scarf but... Fish, right? Mm. It's a bit better, though. Isn't it? Yeah, because well, it doesn't get affected. Yeah, it doesn't worry about uh, it doesn't intimidate. get affected by intimidate exactly. Intimidate and goes through protects. Um, mm -hmm. I think that as long as you've got redirection and you got star first through rapid strike, it pretty much shuts down Cinderace leads. Uh, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, especially well, it depends. It depends if, if you've got helping hand as well, you can pick up the KO for sure on Cinderace. Um, but that's as long as you don't expect, let's say, a tailwind support on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's also, I think, if I remember correctly, if they're running Cinderace without, like, any bulk, if you run Adamant Scarf um, yeah. Rapid Strike, I think it puts it in range, like, 90-something percent of the time to knock itself out with Life Orb. Yeah. So that is kind of a play. But, I mean, it is still going to get at least one hit <laughs> off, and that's also depending on the fact that it has, like, zero bulk invested in it, too. Now, I would say... Probably ninety percent of aces don't have any bulk, but <laughs> probably ninety-five. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I don't expect many to have. You you often need it to like be able to KO most of what you need. You need pretty much all of it yeah. there. Yeah, one hundred percent. But I think it's good. It's good because um, you get to outspeed um, certain threats. You get to outspeed the Weavile that we've been seeing. Not Weavile, Sneasel and Weavile. Mm -hmm. um, you get to outspeed them both when they usually like being paired up next to Colossal. Um, sure. Obviously, it has a surprise factor. It is best of one, so surprise factor is a thing. But, of course, Rapid Strike Urshifu staff has been increasing in popularity, so people are a bit more aware of that. At least that's what I thought um, up mm. until this point. But um, no, it's a good one. I think Scarf in general on either Urshifu, if you're going to play it, is not a bad play. Um, yeah. I, I used it to a lot of success throughout um, my playing in Series 5. So um, I think it's it's cool. There's a lot of options that it can do. Um, shouldn't be ignored. Yeah. And in a best of one format, maybe better than maybe the next stage of the qualifiers but still not a bad pokemon even in a best of three either because it does mm -hmm. put on a certain mm -hmm. amount of pressure costa getting back to your uh question about the bulky cinderace only one percent according to pecolytics uh run any right. sort of bulk so we're quite safe go. in those numbers there yeah. <laughs> only, only you lee with the electro ball weakness policy oh that was <laughs> so good i've actually tried that that was so fun <laughs> i have got a better like i i changed to uh salt vest uh at the back end of series five that was really good i really enjoyed a salt vest cinderace but it it played a little bit differently uh than obviously just going and just smacking things around it was a bit more of a long game so you got at least the benefit of maybe playing Cinderace once it, it's Dynamax had ended. But uh, yeah, that was quite fun. But that's me all over, isn't it? Playing something like that <laughs> rather <laughs> than just the standard stuff um, that actually works. But um, yeah, I think those those things to think about are, are really important. Um, and yeah, so is there anything, anything other than are we going to move on from Urshifu? Is there anything you want to mention about that canal? Do you have a little insight into the uh, the scarf there or the Urshifu as a, as a check? Or and band. Just the band, I love band. Let's say I band. Band stage. I definitely yeah. prefer band. Uh, I, yeah. I, mean, I don't really have any thoughts on scarf. I think you guys covered it all. Uh, it sounds like it could work. I mean, it's pretty straightforward with any of those items, right? Like, I, I think the, what are the three most common? It's got to be like sash, scarf, and band, right? I mean, I'm not saying in that particular order, but I'd say that that's pretty much what I would expect to see on any given Urshifu, be Definitely. it the dark type or the sash. water type. I think you should expect the sash until proven otherwise. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah, Just so more about yeah. Every other yeah. Just don't lose to the fact that you think it's sash and then suddenly it outspeeds you and you're done. <laughs> don't run a colossal into a rapid stride rush if you're basically. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do, at least be ready to move it. Like, you know, have a game plan, yeah. be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's move on to, uh, well, it's probably about time we wrapped up, really, friends. <laughs> is, there, um, is there any other 
specific Pokemon that you would like to mention uh, before we, we move into the latter part of the show um, and our hot takes, or is are we kind of covered most things uh, to get people in the in a good mind frame, good place going into Players Cup this this coming weekend? I think, um, and uh, Costas brought this up before and and recently here, um, some stuff here like how not to tilt some wins win streaks versus loss streaks is probably a good topic to touch on unless you yeah. uh we're gonna do that in this end end phase here i know it's completely it's a good point i think it's a good topic to definitely talk about um i've obviously played probably more ics than majority of you guys uh so oh, um, <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> um but no i i mean i've got a good a lot of experience with uh the 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 whole having a bad tournament tilting um and what kind of what i tend to do to try and um clear my head and kind of reset and i think you've got to do that i think that's such an important thing to to kind of keep in mind if you have a little run where uh, you may be doing well and then you hit a few losses in a row and those losses don't keep coming the best thing to do for me personally is to just put put it down step away and have go do something else go do something else for an hour half an hour just get a drink walk away from the, the system and walk away from the games don't think about it don't dwell on it because that's when the frustration will build and it'll just keep getting worse and worse and worse and you've got to get to the point where you're going to want to throw your switch out the window and and rant on twitter and just all the bad things so the best thing at least it works for me anyway is even if the, after one loss i mean just sit back it's generally quite good to do this in in tournaments anyway and just playing in general get the most out of that loss look at why you lost if it was bad rng why was it bad rng there are ways to do it and you know that methodical way of thinking about it can kind of bring you back down to earth and get you more thinking in the frame of mind that's going to actually help you create good game and board positions going into your next match and how you're going to actually approach it rather than be like okay i know i've got this lead it's really good against this team i'm just going to lead that and click these buttons and hope that i win because most of the time you know there is someone with a, a, an iq more than five sitting across the table than you that is going to be able to predict that and then you're going to get stomped on again and the cycle is going to start so my best advice is take take five minutes even you don't even need to take long but i normally take maybe half an hour to an hour away get a drink chill out forget about it, and then come back to it more refreshed re-motivated and then go from there that would be my hot take on uh if you've got a bad run tilting and dealing with it i think that's at least how i would kind of manage it hopefully that's helpful to a few of you guys but it would be great to hear your thoughts though the rest of you guys on on what you kind of do to manage that sort of situation because it's something that happens all the time in every sort of um uh tournament environment yeah so i think uh, one of the big things like audi mentioned earlier is uh before you start playing the ic kind of think about what your goal rating is right is your goal here to qualify for the Players' Cup, or is it to get the highest rating in the IC, or is it just to play for fun? right? And based on that, decide what rating you're trying to aim for. If your goal in this instance right, is to qualify for Players' Cup, let's say that you have 1,700 rating as your, as your goal, because that's a pretty safe one. Yeah. Um, before you start playing, right? first of all, make sure you're hydrated, make sure you've eaten some food, make sure you're in a good spot, you know, to, to sit down to play some games for a couple hours. Uh, start playing your games. If you lose, think about why you lost. Think about what you've lost to, right? Before before you even move on to the next game, even if you lost to, like, getting hacks, think about why did that specific hacks cause you to lose that game? And is there a way that you can game plan around that to avoid that moving forward? Um, and that's, you know, o over the course of, you know, potentially 45 games, that's going to help you an insanely like it's going to help you an insane amount to you're going to come out a better player regardless yeah definitely definitely and you know you're going to feel comfortable when you're in the same situation again if this hacks happens again i've experienced this before i'm not going to be surprised by it i'm not going to tilt by it i'm going to think about what i can do to potentially come out of this um the other thing is if you're a player that generally suffers from anxiety before tournaments or you you know you feel very anxious you have a hard time focusing on games make sure that especially if you know that you're kind of that you're this kind of player make sure that you're very 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 comfortable with what you're using 
and practice a lot beforehand. Just grind games on Showdown, grind games with your friends. Uh, maybe even, you know, like set up a little phone stream in Discord, stream to your friends, just talk to them during the games so that you can get through this, uh, through, through your anxiousness, right, to play these games, to understand what you're doing, to keep a, a clear head, because that's really what's important to maintain your win streaks here. And, you know, you, you want to play as many games as you can. Uh, sorry, as few games as you can and get to the highest rating possible, right? That's the goal yeah. of every I. And so the more games you're winning, the less you're losing. That's, you know, uh, that's your goal, right? And so uh, make sure you're relaxed, make sure you're hydrated, make sure you've eaten some food, take breaks, make sure you take breaks. Don't try and play all of your games at once because uh, I know for me, especially after a while, if I'm playing too much Pokemon, it, it starts to get monotonous, right? I start to think, uh, I, I start to lose my train of thought. I start to think, oh, I've experienced this before. I'm going to do the same thing that I did then. And yeah. you, it, it's it's a trap that you fall into, right? You're going to start losing. When you start losing your train of thought, that's when you stop being able to focus on your game and execute your game plans effectively. Well, you're going into autopilot, essentially. Right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's so easy to fall into that as well. You've been playing for an hour and a half. It's so easy just to think, yeah, it's, I just start clicking buttons then and just thinking, yeah, well, I just played that, so I'd do the same. And it's not always the case of, of being able to do that. It's some uh, amazing advice, Kunal. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we did have a little funny message from Johnny there. He says, don't lose to hacks. He, uh, he wins due to hacks. So I can <laughs> confirm this. So. I can confirm this. Same. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've all found that. So Costa, do you... What would uh, do you want to have a little chip in on this one to uh, say how you kind of manage and and cope with this this sort of thing? Um, if there's anything you would like to add to what's already been mentioned, um, I mean, I tend to usually go to the corner and cry, have a little <laughs> weep <laughs> when it's some exceptionally bad RNG. Um, but no, um, I think everything that you guys have covered have been absolutely spot on. Um, like what I tend to do is. You know, like I have, first of all, you have to recognize it. You have to be able to, in your mind, put, pull yourself out of it because you have to pull yourself out and say, okay, am I all right? This has clearly upset me. Okay. Um, if it's upset me this much and I'm already thinking about it, then I should take a break. Um, what I tend to do is I usually go for a shower because with frustration and uh, especially in losing streaks, you overheat. Uh, or at least your brain starts overheating. At least that's what I'm imagining for myself. And I just go, I have a shower. It's a cool, complete cool off. Um, I think it really helps. I wouldn't say five minutes. I would definitely say the half an hour plus that Lee's saying. Um, I don't think five minutes is enough for your brain to process that. Um, it, you need to absolutely clear off of it. You know that it's going to come back at some point, but you have to get your mind off of it. And the breaks the breaks essential um keeping yourself hydrated essential um it, treat it like a sport um because that is basically what you're forcing your mind and body to go into sure you think well i'm not doing much i'm just sitting around and clicking buttons but no it's also about the body as well because effects that your body uh goes through is going to affect your mind and that's going to affect your state of mind and play and your patience level you got to be really patient um, just know that in the end of the day, it's best of one. You're aware of this. It's ladder. You're aware of this. And people are going to bring, bring some really crazy things and some crazy things are going to happen. So you just need to remember that, reflect on that, take breaks, have showers. I'm not saying that you smell. I'm saying that I need showers because I need to snap my mind out of it because there's no other way to snap it. And just try to enjoy and laugh. Laugh when you see ridiculous RNG because um, it's better than crying, trust me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like, at the end of the day, right, you started playing Pokemon because it's fun to you, because you enjoyed it, because yeah. you're a fan of the franchise, right? Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind when you're playing. You know, there, there's more to this than the competition. You're playing because you're here to have a good time. Yeah. And if you're not having a good time, then, you know, why are you playing? At, right? Sure. Yeah. So. I mean, I think I've got like. That was right. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, no. I, I, you know what? You guys really like nail meathead. Like you, you definitely answered a lot of it. I think I've got maybe two things that I can add to that. 
Um, one is when you're playing your game, make sure that when you get tilted, like during the actual physical game, remember yeah. that you don't have to rush to your next decision. Take your time, like in the middle of that game, like you have a time, you have an amount of time to pick your next Pokemon going in. Think about how you can recover from that position that you've currently just been put in. Like lots of people will get tilted right there and then they'll say, no, it's over. I've lost right then and there. No, you have like 30, 45 seconds, whatever it is to sit there and actually calm yourself a little bit while you're in the middle of that match and try and make a plan forward from here. Now, maybe it's going to be reliant on them reading you in a certain way, or they're going to have to not do this or not do that. But don't just assume that it's done and over right there, okay? Do take that time that they've allotted you to bring yourself back down to your center a little bit and then try and move forward from there. Now, the only other thing that I can really speak to is a win streak is just as important as a loss streak because it can give you a big head and a big ego. Yeah. And it can also set you into kind of an autopilot. So what I like to do is even if I've gotten like, five or six wins in a row or something like that. I still like to step away for a little bit and kind of reflect not just upon like how I've played and what I've done, but the fact that, okay, just because I've won doesn't mean that I've got this down to a science. Doesn't mean that I have nailed down my plans perfectly and nobody's going to be able to stop me. You have to kind of take some of that ego away from yourself and remember that there's other guys just as smart as you on the other side of this table and you're going to encounter them sooner or later. And maybe you have some great game plans, but you know, to me, it's, it's, it's maybe not the same as getting tilted from being lost, but there is definitely an effect from a win streak that I've seen a lot of people been suddenly stumble into a losing streak because they've gotten too big of a head from their win streak. I think that's all I can really add though. All, all these guys have had really great points, things that I've used myself. I mean, in Pokemon, in my own personal career, um, I have to deal with a lot of nerves too. So I, I think that that's really all solid, solid advice from everybody. here. That's amazing advice. I think from all of you guys. So thank you so much. Um, uh, it's, it's so invaluable from the experiences that you guys have had and, and kind of relaying that to a lot of players that maybe are struggling with that kind of side of it. Um, and especially the, the, the win streak aspe aspect as well, that maybe, you know, doesn't get touched upon so much because there is that well, you mentioned Krim about having that kind of ego boost almost because you're on such a hot streak. You're thinking, uh, yeah, I can walk on water and it's not always, um, as easy as that because your next opponent is always going to be as hard as your last loss, you know, uh, your last win, even or any, you know, whatever that goes. But um, I think one of the things that Adi mentioned earlier and, and Kunal, you've touched on it again, is picking your times when to play uh, your games um, and, and being smart about that strategically. We touched on it at the very start of the, uh, the stream here tonight. And I think that's another thing to touch upon before we move into the last segment of the, uh, the stream here. And that is just maybe not having to play them all at once. There is no rush to play them. The 15 games carry over into your Sunday. You're not going to need to play all 45 games. Hopefully, fingers crossed, you've got a bar to get to. Pick your times that are most convenient to you that fit in over those three days and play as much as you can when you can and as just just as much as you can. And I think that's something to think about as well um, and don't overdo it. And like Kunal said as well, a huge important point of this is you play this game to have fun. So make sure you have fun. If you're not having fun with it, don't play, you know? It's not the end of the world if you don't qualify for Players' Cup 2. It's really not. There'll be other tournaments. So it's about having fun at the end of the day. Obviously, everyone wants to do well, but, you know, there is only a certain amount of people that are going to qualify to the next stage. Sometimes it isn't going to be you, unfortunately. And, then, you know, that's the thing. That's the way of looking at it and building on anything if you don't make it you know build on that so you've got to take the positive side of every every angle of this and if you qualify great then that is job done but you know sometimes it doesn't always work out like that um you know um i had my own issues in players cup one why i didn't qualify but we'll not go into that now but um i'm hoping to qualify this time 
I was sad not to play last time, but you know, I've been having fun ever since Players Cup won, the qualifiers happened. I've been really enjoying the format. So it's not to say it's the end of the road if you don't qualify for this tournament. So I'll just give you that two cents. But um anything you guys would like to add before we I think we're probably due to kind of wrap up with our hot takes. I think that's what everyone's waiting on now, really, going into the weekend. Is there anything else we'd like to mention before going into that and wrapping up? I think we're about ready. Yeah, we've come yeah. a lot. We're ready. <laughs> ready. Definitely. No, I, yeah. Okay. Who wants to kick us off with hot takes for this weekend? We're doing our clockwise. <laughs> Start with me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, I have a I have a few hot takes. Um, this is the best of one I see, obviously. So, one team or one one combination of Pokemon that I expect to do very well is Dusclops plus Dragalge. The the poison dragon Pokemon, you know? Yeah. Um, Dragology has the adaptability ability, which gives its stab two times damage instead of 1.5. And so Dustclops bulldozing its weakness gives it plus two in special attack. And then it gets to click max poison to boost its special attack further, max warman to lower opposing uh physical attack. Right? You know, it's hitting all the common trick room threats. It's hitting Torkoal, it's hitting Primarina. Um it's hitting Tyranitar with Wormwind. Yeah. And so I think that this Pokemon, especially in a best of one format where the Dust Clubs could also potentially have Ally Switch, is definitely something that would probably perform very well. Uh, it resists Rillaboom as well. It hits Incineroar. You know, there's just like, there's a lot that it hits and a yeah. lot of common Pokemon that it resists. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, think, that's a yeah, very go good ahead. pick. Yeah, yeah. No, um, sorry. Another thing that I think is going to do very well is. Uh, Inteleon. We haven't seen a lot of Inteleon in Series 5, but Inteleon also has the, you know, the starter Z-move that has 160 base power. Yeah, and it gets yes. to run Snipeshot, right? So Life Orb Inteleon Snipeshot actually just one-shots Arcanine. Ar uh, Max Geyser one-shots Durant. Max Geyser one-shots Terrakion. It one-shots Cinderace. Like, this Pokemon hits so much, and it's faster than Cinderace by one point. Right? It's just yeah. an incredible Pokemon to use. <clears throat> Especially in best of one, where you know you can icy wind on this Pokemon and use it to your other Pokemon. You can run soak. You just run it as an individual offensive Pokemon. Um, it can do a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Kunal actually that that was gonna be my hot take. So that's <laughs> I, should, I, should go first. I completely agree. No, 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 no. I feel like I always take over the conversation. I gotta, I gotta, you know, like shut up and listen sometimes. Uh -huh. I got I got one more to go through, and then I'll come back at the end with a final input. Um, Love the, it. The last hot take is I think that coaching stuff is going to be very very strong. This this mm -hmm. player's got uh, coaching off of Riolu is pretty good because because of, of the prankster uh, coaching. If you don't know, gives your partner plus one attack plus one defense. Can't and be redirected too. Yeah, it's not targeted, so you can't follow me to redirect it or anything like that. It can go through protect as well, can't it? Yes, I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's insane. Coaching your Rillaboom, coaching your Cinderace, you know, coaching a Pokemon like Snorlax that runs pretty bulky but benefits from the plus attack is pretty good. Uh, coaching Gyarados is pretty good. You know, there's like all these that benefit so much from the plus one attack, plus one defense. Even a Pokemon like Togekiss, right, giving it plus one defense, even though it's not yeah. benefiting from the attack, is very good. Yeah, that's yeah, really yeah. nice option. And there's a lot of mons that can run it too. Like I yeah, had, exactly. I was using Scarf or Shifu, and I think it's even on my paste. I had coaching on there because I wanted to also be able to max guard to stall out to get my scarf back. And so I was like, okay, what's actually useful at the same time? And I was like, let's go with coaching. Yep. I mean, there's there was no mm -hmm. way to stop it. NDD um, could bust out psychic terrain. You couldn't fake it out then. Yep. So I think it's very powerful. Uh, Terrakion gets coaching, but yep. the Pokemon yep. that I'm really interested in coaching with is Mienchou. Because uh -huh. Mienchou actually cannot be intimidated. Yeah. Uh, and it's very fast. On a five, it's isn't on it? Speed. Yeah. yeah. It's it gets great. fake out, it gets taunt, it gets high jump kick, and it gets coaching. Hmm. And it gets bullet punch if you want to try to mm -hmm. proc a weakness policy toad kiss. I'm just saying. Just yeah. Saying. yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> It's knockoff, yeah. Focus. Yeah, inner focus means it can't be faked out, and it also can't be intimidated. Yes. Oh, I, yeah, I was going to bring that up if you did. Well. Yeah. Uh, also gets ally switch as well, just for, mm -hmm. just for oh, yeah. 
<laughs> we, all, we all know. We all know. Just, <laughs> just one of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hot. There's a hot take. Like, go on Cerebi or whatever and look up Ally Switch before you go and play this tournament. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Facts. So, yeah, just, I think those are those are my three hot take Pokemon or teams that I think will do well. That's some nice ideas. I like them. I like the mind show a lot. I like that a lot. I think that's a very good, cool, cool pick. Dragalge as well. I think obviously we've seen it really do very well in series five. So that's another Pokemon I think uh, has a lot of potential. So really good picks there. Uh, Canal, thanks. And we'll come back to you. You said you got one more to finish off with? Yeah, just at the very end. He's okay, the very end. He's, yeah, the cherry, the cherry on top. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would say so. Okay, Krim, you're up next. I'm useless for this. So I was going to mention Inteleon um, in a slightly different way, though, I guess. Um, so I have found it useful on a number of teams where I actually already had redirection. Mm -hmm. And I had been seeing a lot, and I mean a lot, of like screens and Grimmsnarl, et cetera, et cetera. So I took more advantage of Sniper and Scope Lens and Focus Energy. Mm -hmm. um, like Kunal was saying, you get a uh, base 160 water attack um i'm i now i'm trying to remember what the exact calc was i haven't looked at it in a while because i wasn't prepared for hot takes today but <laughs> um i didn't do my homework but i uh i was able to take out a max duraludon after focus energy with that so wow. <laughs> which is which resists disgusting. which is disgusting yeah through uh. like light screen so um i thought that that was that was definitely cool I played a lot of Inteleon. Actually, it was on my, I can't remember if it was top, I think it was top four uh, series two team. Mm -hmm. And I played it uh, alongside with Gothitel and a few other things. I think something um, that people don't look at often on Inteleon that's also valuable is the fact that it gets all kinds of support moves. Like it, like Kunal mentioned, it gets icy wind, but it also gets screens, yeah. um, which can be very handy. It also gets soap, which can be handy next to something like Rillaboom. So <clears throat> I think that it is a really cool Pokemon and definitely a hot take for me as well, because there is a number of ways to run it. And because it can counter, like I said, without repeating Kunal, a number of very popular things in this format. So um, that's, that's. Oh, he's gone. Yeah, he's, oh, he's frozen <laughs> right there. The worst moment. No, he's there. He's back. He's back. So great. What was the last? Oh, he's, he's either doing it on purpose or he's just. Oh, there's an. Oh, no. <laughs> there you go. Okay. There's a number of ways to run this. So, and again, uh, credit credit to Luigi for um, reminding me of, of how disgusting that game can be played. But if you if you recall, like there's more than one way to just run Parish Trap, right? Like it doesn't have to necessarily be um, uh, Poly Trap. We've seen on ladder um, can do some gross things and uh, can also sit in front of some things that it shouldn't be able to. So my my second hot take is going to be uh, Parish Trap and. I'm not necessarily the Gengar version, but I, I have I have enjoyed um, watching some just infuriating destruction be be. I, I know the not super exciting ones, but <laughs> no, they're cool, man. Thank you so much. So Parish is the second one there. The 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 line was a little bit bad, mate. We're breaking up a little bit, but we. Oh, get I'm sorry. The... No, 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 it's not your fault, mate. We get the gist of it, but uh, the Intellion, obviously, there, really nice uh, pick. We got all of that, and the uh, the Perish, obviously, a really nice answer as well to uh, to round off with. And uh, my options for a hot take or uh, being last or uh, uh, slowly whittling away. Um, <laughs> Costa, up next, what would you say, mate? Is if okay. you had a hot pick for this weekend, what would it be? Oof. Okay, so I just want to mention, by the way, for Intellion, very quick, it gets missed. And not a lot of yep. people think about mist. Yeah. Um, they, that's able to um, basically block any stat reductions on your team for five turns. I'm just haze as know. well. I mean, haze. Yeah, true. Haze. I see when there's so many things. It but has yeah. a ton of support. It actually does. But, anyways, I'm going on to mine. Um, hot tapes. Dudrio. You didn't expect me to say that, did you? Which one? Alola or Kanto? Nah, no, nah, Kanto. No, original. <laughs> <laughs> original, original trap, right? Arena they, trap. Yeah, yeah, original hot dog on a hill. 
Oh yeah, outspeed Cinderace by one, same speed as Inteleon. Mm. So if you want to get rid of Cinderace, you got an issue with it. You know who to go to. You know to go to Dudria. No, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I should count that one. But I think uh, I think Persian could be cool. Um, yeah. Obviously based on matchups, uh, but I think I've seen Godrills alone in Persian, and it can function as a really good support. It's got icy winds, got the pine shot, fake out. It's got its fur coat ability, which makes it even bulkier when it comes to defense um, stat. But uh, I mean, if you're really crazy, you could go for the rattled ability um, onto the Persian as well. But yeah. you know that, that that's next level stuff. I'm not sure if that works uh, well with weakness policy. That's dark ghost and what other type um, that procs it? I don't remember. I don't remember either. Mm. Anyways, <laughs> rarely used ability. Yeah, we don't rarely, <laughs> rarely use ability. Bud, bud, but um, I think bud would be the one. But that's with a U-turn uh, idea that I've yeah. had with um, trying to proc my own Persians rattled and then weakness policy as well. That's then you nice. get it at um, plus one speed and outspeeds Dragapult and all that stuff. But um, pro I, I mean. Uh, there's not much of hot takes I'd say. Like, I'm not adding anything intellectual to this conversation right now. I'm just <laughs> saying Alola Persian. I'm saying Dudrio. Um, no, Alola I... Persian's a great shout, man. Like, it gets like beat it, up yeah. and stuff, too. Like, there's mm. there's a lot of good things that it can do. Yeah, I mean, it, it does. To be honest, it does have a lot of options. Um, it's just all about, you know, Toad Kiss coming back. It doesn't mean it's good for Persian's uh, case. But... Um, Another final one, like my honest real hot take, is uh, not completely a hot take. It's kind of like a semi-hot, semi-cold. Depends on which way you see the cup, um, half full, half not. Um, would be weakness policy, Corviknight. Um, because Ooh. good luck trying to stop it once you get it going. And, weakness policy. Um, That's, yeah. yeah. Because it will one-hit KO the Cinderace if the Cinderace dares to go into it and you have the right support next to it. And it will just delete it and then get your Pokemon to plus one. And then if you have the right support next to it, you could even get its HP back up, you could redirect, and good luck trying to stop it. It's nice. I like that a lot, man. I do like just that to, a lot. Uh, to quickly add on to that, I think Weakness Policy Incident is also something that I would yeah. consider kind of in the same vein. For a oh, back yeah. of one, for sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, we saw we saw Kutesh use it in mm. for, uh, in the previous players' cup. He ran weakness policy with uh, it was flare blitz close combat. I think earthquake. Yeah, and, like yeah, uh, move. And yeah. It, was it? It's just yeah, it's very very good. It's hard to stop it once it gets going. And very similar vein to Corviknight as well. Yeah, yeah, he, I re really like, like Braviary as well with bulk up. Um, I've seen that used to some good effect too. Oh. Hmm. That'd be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit yeah, more that's tough. A really nice one. I, I mean, Braviary, it makes sense, but then it's just Braviary being Braviary. Like, you just want to try to utilize it straight away. It's not usually the support, not support, the setup kind of Pokemon that you go. But I mean, it makes sense if you're trying to shut it down and there is no lightning rod and all that. Weakness policy Braviary will absolutely destroy you if you let it. Especially because it's like the max airstream roll ons as well. It's like, just bulky enough to live the super effective hits. And then, I mean, you don't even need bulk up to really utilize the weakness policy. It's just an yeah. additional benefit that you can proc beforehand. It's, a, it's an additional salt that you want to try to lay onto your opponents <laughs> if they let you get it going, essentially. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's all from my hot tapes or lukewarm takes as uh, nappy's been saying i think they wanted cold takes too that was a request earlier oh cold like, what, what do you cold. what do you think are the crappy ones but let lee do his oh. hot takes and then we'll, maybe we oh, can yeah. do a quick run through oh, of what enough. we think is just garbage Depl depleted for hot takes now if uh, i it's a bad thing i should have went first shut <laughs> up. Shut up. <laughs> we should have talked about this beforehand we should have <laughs> I got the bad trade off here. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you've mentioned like all stuff. I think like there's some really cool stuff. Obviously, I've never thought about the weakness policy Corviknight. I think that's a really good uh, suggestion there. Really great idea. Obviously, Inteleon as well. Amazing Pokemon. 
Uh, both you Kunal and Krim mentioned and I think still being a little bit slept on honestly I think because with speed stat and the format its ability to just actually nuke on stuff is incredible um what I try and have tried to do I, I haven't been able to put anything together for this um uh, but what something that I did want to try and get to work it was something that I, I played a lot and this is based again of uh, conversations with Kunal and series three or series four i can't remember but uh it was all uh, when you look at the, the 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 teams from um the 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 the, the last players cup the top eight teams and even further down there is there's a massive ice weakness there there's a huge huge ice weakness going right through a lot of the teams and uh if you've got a strong ice type pokemon especially spamming something like blizzard or something similar to that it it does cause a lot of issues for your opponent and uh creates a lot of offensive pressure that they sometimes can't deal with and especially if you're pairing it uh next to something that can control speed and things like that so um i guess if i'm going to say anything i would say what i was trying to get work was glacian um and that would be my hot take it's a it's probably a cold take as well on <laughs> lit literally a cold take but quite uh, literally yeah yeah i'm uh, i'm gonna throw that one out and that is that is where i'm gonna leave it but glacian a very a very cool pokemon surprisingly bulky um can cause all sorts of issues especially like i said with the correct speed control and support next to it something like cinderace glacian can work pretty well together um so and you know if you've got the dracovish in the back for support or another uh strong water type maybe primarina in there it could also work um Glacier can do some work. Obviously, you're going to need a bit of uh, support around it to uh, allow it to do that. But it hits like a truck, and um, it's got decent special defense as well. So it would surprise you. But uh, that'll be mine there. And we'll uh, with that, I'm going to not mention anything else and just throw it over to you, Kunal, to uh, take the show away with your your final. Yeah. yeah so uh, real take. quick, real quick about Glacier, though. Uh, my good friend Vishy, you might know him as Flying Falcon Seven. Mm -hmm. He's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he top 16 Dallas, and he actually had a Glaceon on his team. And he's probably the only person I've ever seen use Glaceon. Uh, and I think that Glaceon is like actually a really, really solid Pokemon in this format. It yeah. has like a pretty good speed tier. It has really good defense, really good special defense, very solid special attack. Um, and, you know, it's able to hit Primarina. It's able to hit Dragapult. It's able to hit Dracovish. It, it just has like... As you said, ice coverage is just so solid. Uh, Freeze and it does, is big. Yeah, exactly. It does. Mm. It just does such a good job of like being a fifth or sixth Pokemon on a team to kind of round a team out and cover up some weak matchups. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to say, Costa, you said that it was kind of like a cherry on top, but I actually, I think it's kind of the opposite. I'm going to bring us back down to earth from these hot takes. No. The hottest, the quote unquote hottest take I have is that the thing that you should expect to see the most is better variation Son teams. We're bringing Son all the way back, right? Mm -hmm. I think that people are going to, people have been developing Son teams much further than they were developed in the first. And I think that uh, there's going to be some Sun teams with Pokemon that people aren't expecting and some, you know, some builds that people have not considered before. Uh, I actually, I know that for a fact, but, uh, <laughs> I think that the the number of sun teams that you're going to see in the IC is going to blow your mind. And it's the hottest take. I think is. that is the hottest take. <laughs> I think that is the hottest take. It's the warmest take. Yeah. It's, the, <laughs> it's got all of the puns. My my take my take is that sun is the best archetype in series five, and I think that this IC is going to be very representative of that. I, I'm going to agree yeah, too. Actually, yeah. That's uh, that's where I will end my thoughts there. So cold um, takes for fun. Is this what we're doing now? Uh, define cold takes. What are we doing? Yeah. Like, like, what do you think is Pokemon. absolute garbage? Yeah. I think that was, I think that was the question. I saw it in comments. I forget who had it, but it was, it, we pulled it up earlier. Okay. What do I think is absolute garbage? Let's see. Um, Come on, back up that wheezing statement. I was going to say, Intellion. Bring Intellion back. Sure. I'll back it up. I think that wheezing is a garbage Pokemon, and I think that <laughs> is not. <laughs> um, on a serious note, though, I think probably teams that are trying, like Lapras teams that are trying to be uh, similar to like Series 3 Lapras with the support of Lapras and the offensive team around it are probably mm. not going to do well. 
I think those are going yeah. to be teams that don't perform at all. That's fair. That's no, it's, it. yeah. I, mean, I just think they, they're not matched up well against Sun. They're not really matched up well against Tyranitar, against Urshifu, against Porygon Z. It's just like mm -hmm. pretty hard to justify running that kind of team. Well, because they've literally, they're outdated. That's why. Yeah, um, exactly. Because of how drastically the meta's changed. Like yep. it's so high impact right now. And it's all about positioning too. So yep. it's a tough one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Krim. Your okay. Take. Garbage. Garbage. What do I think is garbage? Um, Don't say <clears> it. <throat> Don't you dare say my one. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm a little gun shy here, man. I mean, all right. You want to? Why don't you go know. first? No, you go first because last time I did it and we we took a bunch away from you. So now I'll go. I'll, I'll go third this time. Can I baton pass this time successfully? <laughs> I shall accept the baton pass. All right, there we go. Um, right, Nappy's probably gonna like chuck a fit at me. I think it was Nappy. Um, Bolton, um, because it doesn't have the correct move pool. If it right, had, no, no, no. hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, 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 so, oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> here's the thing about Bolt Hunt, okay? Uh -huh. Bolt Hunt gets this really cool move called Electrify, where True. it's Electrify, and it makes yeah. your opposing, like the, your target's attack, Electric type. So, <laughs> Sorry, I saw chat. <laughs> the, the idea that we had <laughs> series three or series four was that we lead Bolt Hunt's Excadrill, right? <laughs> We electrify the threat to the Excadrill so it can set up Swords Dance because obviously electric moves don't affect Excadrill. And then if there's a Corviknight, we can electrify our own plus two Excadrill to kill the Corviknight. And plus two Excadrill beats everything else. Yeah. So I agree that it's bad, but don't say bad stuff about it. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's I just cool. wish, I wish it was better. Like, I just wish. I really wish. It just it looks like it has so much good potential. Electrify true. That is something going for it, other than the waste of competitive as ability, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I all right. Know. There's there's gonna be a lot of disagreement here. Like Kunal and I are gonna have probably like a 20 minute po like post video chat about wheezing now, you know. <laughs> it's bad man, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, do you want to go? Do you want to go, or or like, because you went last last time, and and you should be you should be first. In, in okay, the I mean, here. I don't necessarily think well, there are bad Pokemon, obviously, but not not in the not really in. I mean, what was there? Was there a Drapion in Top Cut? I'm not saying that's bad. I think bad pick for this event going into it would be something like, uh, and this comes off the back of of uh, obviously. Kunal saying about the Sun teams, I think Ferrothorn was a very prominent Pokemon in the last Players' Cup. I don't think it's a Pokemon players should be relying on as heavily going into this one. So that would be my cold take for uh, for this one. So there we go. There's mine. And uh, on to you, Krim. Wait, which one? Uh, Drapion? Hmm? Did you say Drapion? It was Drapion in, in, in the top cut somewhere? I'm sure it was, wasn't it? How dare you? <laughs> Drapion's amazing! <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean oh. in the anime it's design's cool, but it's just it's just it just doesn't it's again it's a bit like Bolton, isn't it? It's got the syndrome of just not being able to <laughs> Lee don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you and me are done. <laughs> How to end uh, a relationship in ten seconds. <laughs> bring up Drapion as a call take. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Costa. It wasn't my official call take. It was just I just mentioned it as an example. But a Ferrothorn <laughs> was definitely the uh, definitely what I would say. It's not gonna be as good as uh, it was previously. So yeah, don't use yeah. it. So, okay, yeah, Sun as well. Yeah. I've I've got I've got I think I've got like two cold takes then. Um so number one cold take is I think that uh, Drift Bloom is Garbo. I'm uh, in, in this format. I've seen people use it with Grassy Seed. I've seen people use it with Psychic Seed, and I've never once seen it used successfully. So that is that is my coldest of cold takes. I think my one that will be less well received is Hydreigon. I think that it's really not going to be good for a lot of things here, considering how much we've got out there to deal specifically with Urshifus and other stuff just like that. 
I just don't think that it's going to be a great idea to be dragging out a double fairy weakness uh, <laughs> into into this, where a lot of people are going to be preparing for and having stuff to be able to deal with one of the most popular Pokemon in the series. So those are my cold takes. That. Yeah, don't yeah. use Hydreigon. No, especially not in a format with Togekiss. You just no. can't. It's not good. series six makes sense because you know yes. obviously a little bit more off. yes 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 yeah, but yeah. series five nah. <laughs> it's true uh, mm. yep yep there we go I've, I've lit up chat with Trifloom too so we've all successfully angered somebody here with our cold takes <laughs> that's, that's what, what we're, we're supposed to do <laughs> cold take that's it so here's my here's my closing advice okay if you uh, saw a team of Pokemon or a series of Pokemon that you thought that you would like to use. Put them together, put a Grim Snarl on your team, and call it a day. Just you know, give yourself screen support to give yourself room to maneuver, and then use four Pokemon that are like solid together, and you know, fill in your last slot with a Pokemon that covers a matchup that you're weak to. And I think generally, like that'll get you a reliable 1700 rating, as long as you're playing well. Yeah, that is some good advice there, right there. Yeah, if you're struggling for a team, that is solid advice. Yeah. It's Take it, people. Advice. Otherwise, you won't qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going around doing doing closing advice? Is that is that the segment of the show? That's all I I, just to, I just wanted to uh, mention Grimstar because we hadn't mentioned it all yet. That's true. No, yeah, that's Grim fair. Star, I mean, Grimstar's should have, we we should have mentioned it because I mean it, it's it's speed control and it's also good support in a number of ways and I think that people moving to Spirit Break is also just added to what it can do. Yeah. An incredible Pokemon. Definitely look at it now. Um, no, right, we'll wrap it up there, guys. Thank you so much for your time. It's nearly been three hours, that's incredible. But I think we've covered everything and anything to do with the Players Cup one, Players Cup two, what to expect, team calls, and things to get you guys in the mind zone for this weekend so you can get through the qualification. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to all you guys that have joined me, Canal. Costa, Krim, thank you so much, guys. Uh, before we head off, obviously, uh, if you guys want to do a little um, a little promotion, self-promotion, feel free to do that um, and just let me know who wants to go first with anything. If you want to have um, a closing word before we, we finish the show tonight. Yeah, sure, I'll go first. So uh, my name is Kanal. You might know me as Shay. You can follow me on Twitter, ShayKirby321. Um, that's pretty much the only social media where I'm active. Uh, and then I also would like to use my little slot here to also re-up Adi, who was with us earlier today. Uh, he had to leave a little bit early, but he makes great YouTube videos. Uh, he has interviews with a lot of the players that did well in Players Cup 1. Uh, and he just makes you know great content. He's a great team builder. He's a great player. So go and check him out. His socials are down below. Great, thank you. And yeah, I'll just reiterate that. Definitely give uh, Addy's YouTube channel a check out and uh, drop him a follow on Twitter. He was on at the very start of the show if you guys missed that, but full of great insights and has some great content. So make sure you do check that out. Over to you, Krim. Um, obviously, you don't have much many socials, but you do have one. I do have one. So I talk to a lot of guys um, and I hear from a lot of different players, uh, especially working with uh, both of Lee's discords. So, I mean, I don't have a Twitter. Uh, I'm not, I'm not really big on that. And uh, most of the other social media you'll find on me is music related. So go ahead and feel free to hit me up over here. Um, I think shout outs for me, definitely um, to these guys here for being awesome and for doing what they do. Kunal is a good friend of mine and we've gone to some tournaments together. We've had good times. I talked to Lee probably more than he wants to hear from me and Costa and I've always had a whole bunch of fun. So um, big shout outs to all of you guys um, and especially Lee for always being so kind to all of us and taking care of us like he's family. Oh. <laughs> That's, That's it. That's night. all I got. <laughs> you see, I should have gone before you. That would have been a lovely way to end it. But now I'm going to say something amazing. shit now, aren't I? <laughs> You've got to try. <laughs> okay, lovely. Uh, sorry, I did. I, I went off PG there. Apologies, Lee. Um, right. Fine, um, <laughs> We're lucky I didn't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, 
listen to everything the others have said. A bit about me is uh, with what I've said as well. Not everything about like crying in the corner, but um, listen to the positive parts. Um, just if you want to enjoy the weekend, just see it as that. See it as exciting. Um, think about the idea of, oh, could I get a good rating? Could I do it well? Could I win? This and that. But remember, obviously, it's a game. I know it's a game we all love. And uh, it's a bit of an obsession, I'd say, but um, at least for myself. Um, uh, but the whole point is to remember to distance yourself as well. Take breaks. Enjoy it. And um, follow the dramatic amount of stuff I've put down there as well, please. I'm going to try to get some YouTube content going and a bit more daily streams as well. And a huge shout out to uh, Blade Runner. I'm not sure if he's here or not, but um, he is basically the architect behind the Corviknight strats because he's opened up my world to a whole new uh, Corviknight perspective, which is just <laughs> amazing. And um, it, it just makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. I wish you all the best of luck. Stay safe, of course, with still this pandemic times. Um, it's tough. It's going to be tough for a while, but we have to just try to persevere and um stay safe and just enjoy the weekend brilliant what a nice way to end now i'll come in and spoil that costa um <laughs> Yay. But, uh, no uh just a big thank you to all three of you again uh obviously it wouldn't have been possible uh without you three and then addy earlier on as well um with some absolutely amazing insights and um great views and perspectives on on just preparing um not only that but whilst you're involved in the tournament as well itself i think just invaluable uh, information for for all the viewers new and old i think um obviously i'm going to do a shameless plug for myself because uh why not join the party but you can follow me on twitter if you want um it's it's twitter it's always exciting isn't it it's a place so come and give me a follow i don't normally <laughs> get involved with all the, the crazy stuff but i'm there no. and uh, occasionally put some humorous stuff out and obviously i uh, have a youtube channel as well uh got pretty much daily content over there at the minute so come and join lots of series six stuff we'll be doing players cups players cup stuff over the next few days and into next week so do come around and of course um this will be going up on youtube so i'll be linking everything if you are watching the rerun all of the the links everything that we've shown will be down in the description all of the socials for all of you guys uh will be down there as well if you want to check anyone out so you can pick that all up and um that about wraps it up i think for this evening it's been an absolute pleasure guys thank you so much uh just good luck to everyone playing in the players cup this weekend and before i do forget if you have enjoyed this if you'd like to see this again um after the qualifiers uh into the next rounds and and so on um and other tournaments and stuff like that do let me know down in the comment section because i would love to hear and i'm sure you guys would be up for coming on and doing more of this in the future um so yeah definitely remember to do that um, and that will be that will be really cool but um we'll wrap things up there guys have a great rest of your evening afternoon whatever time of day it is where you guys are i think for me and costa it's pretty late but for it I mean, looks yeah, you, still you light for Lee, Lee's background is just oh, yeah. definitely oh, yeah. in the dark right yeah I mean, I'm locked in a room <laughs> in a basement. You're locked in a basement. Johnny pointed that out now, too. I think I've seen that scene in Saw. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. not, a, not a place you want to stick around is that, by. Is that what that weird puppet's doing over in the corner? Oof, over here? I don't, there's all kinds. Of, oh, God. Run. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Friends, thank you again. Uh, everyone at home, thanks for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you all hopefully again very soon. So take care of yourselves. Be kind to each other. Be kind to yourself. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>